My wife passed away suddenly on June 2nd, 2020 from a massive heart attack. Nobody ever asked themselves, what would I do if my significant other was not here tomorrow? I wish I would have asked myself that question. Maybe I would have been more prepared. Anyways, two days after she died, I was on my way to do something and at the last minute, I remembered I forgot my phone. So I went back into the house through the hallway and entered my room, got my phone, crossed back into the hallway where I froze in my tracks because I smelled my wife's perfume as if she was standing right next to me. I forgot to say, I knew my wife for 31 years and had been married for 23 years. So that was the first strange thing. About a week and a half ago, I went and collected my wife's ashes and placed them on a coffee table in the living room. That same day, I had someone answer an ad that I had placed on the OfferUp app. I was selling a lamp and I accepted the person's offer. The guy showed up about 5.30pm and bought the lamp. While he was here, he asked if I was selling anything else and I replied yes. I have a chandelier hanging up in the back of the garage that's for sale. I got it down and showed him. I also said I have a gas powered skateboard that I'm selling. It's in the house all boxed up because it's for sale on eBay. Well, he passed on both items. A few hours later, I got a notification on my Instagram page that someone had liked one of the posts and the person had liked two pics I posted, which is not uncommon. I didn't even bother to look at it. The next morning when I got up, I checked that Instagram notification and that person had liked two pics. One was of the skateboard and the other was of the chandelier. Now those two posts are very far apart. In fact, you have to scroll down on my page about 200 pics to get to the chandelier. The person that liked the photo's account was Kerry Mill, which is my wife's maiden name. So I clicked on the account and one of the people that followed her was her niece. Another person that followed her was a manager at an apartment building that we used to live at. Weird, right? So I searched some of my wife's paperwork looking for the password to her Instagram account and I found it. So I went to her account, went to settings and looked at the login activity. The only time that account has been accessed was from our own IP address. What the hell? Next weird thing, last night, about 3 a.m., I'm sitting at my computer in my room and the dog comes in and stops at the foot of the bed. Looks up like she's getting ready to jump up, but doesn't. Instead, she just sits there staring up at nothing and starts wagging her tail and twisting her head back and forth, like someone scratching behind her ears. This goes on for about a minute or so. Last thing today, my son was filling out an application for a student grant for school on his phone. When he was done, he scrolled to the bottom of the page to make sure he didn't miss anything. And you know how at the bottom of an app it says either how many people have used this app or when it was used last? Well, at the bottom of the app, it said it was last used on the 31st of December, 1969. That was my wife's birthday. I wish I was making this up, but I'm not. So my boyfriend and I moved into our apartment mid-September. Our building was built in 1926 and served as a hospital under the end of the Second World War. As you can imagine, the place is filled with energy. Being empathic, I feel residual energy as well as living energy. Living energy as in people's emotions in extreme cases, physical sensations, i.e. nausea, headaches, etc. On to the story now. September 11th. My boyfriend and I pull up to the building for the first time to get the keys. While waiting for our appointment time, I was hit with real bad nausea. This being a common thing because of anxiety and stress, I thought nothing of it. Only having packed the bare essentials to hold us until we could move more stuff in, we stayed the first couple nights. About a week passes and things start disappearing. First, it was my set of keys then a credit card, then my whole wallet. Knowing damn well we aren't losing our stuff, I decided to sage. Things calmed down for the preceding two weeks. One night, my boyfriend and I were watching Poltergeist 
when Minecraft for the Switch flew from the dresser to the ground about three feet away. Breeze? Nope. Close windows. Waiting to get an answer as to why all this is happening, I turned to the necrophobic app. Sitting in my room, candles lit, salt circle, crystals, necrophonic app and some offerings. Ten minutes passed with the app starting to get them adjusted to it. Haley, a near growl says, First spirit sounded promising. Yes, I replied. A soft voice chimes in and says, We wanted to stay. Nothing further happens. Couple days passed and I'm greeted with things moving, scratching on the walls, windows and doors opening and closing, the shower turning on, toilet flushing, and lights turning on. As you've already guessed, the sage pissed them off. In an attempt to reconcile with the dead, I restart the sentence and ask for forgiveness. Only one out of the many forgive us. Every once in a while, he would help us out. For example, yesterday we were up until 4am and my boyfriend had to get up at 2pm for work. The time is 1.58pm. Both of us wake up to a very loud WAKE UP in our ears. In my attempts to make friends with the former guests, I have learned a few of their personalities. This one is the most impressive though. And here we are at the present. Currently sitting in the shower typing at 7am after sleeping two hours and waking up to a spatula in the bathroom sink and the usual nausea, which I didn't mention beforehand because I'm not sure where exactly I could fit it in. My boyfriend's grandfather is an antique collector, and one of his interests is dolls. Porcelain to be exact. They picked this up and the previous owner said to be very careful with it because it was special. Completely unfazed by this statement, he didn't ask any further questions. He brought it home with him about two weeks ago. The first three days were fine and it stayed in the kitchen. The following day, my boyfriend and I were laying in our room down the hall talking. It was around midnight when suddenly three light knocks were heard through the door. We look at each other and from the other side I hear his grandfather say his name. I got up and opened the door while he was getting ready for whatever task his grandfather had in store for him. Upon opening the door, I expected to be brought face to face with him, but no one was there. I closed the door and shrugged it off. But after I closed the door, I could hear footsteps from down the hall. I go out to investigate, but in the distance I can hear both the grandparents snoring. The following day, around the same time, all power to the house was lost and didn't return until 5 or 6 a.m. Throughout that night, only one lamp was on. Don't know how, but occasionally it went out, but for the most part, somehow, it was still being powered. A few more nights go by without anything happening until just a few nights ago. All through the night, there were screams. Not in the house, but right outside. Last night, around 2 or 3 a.m., I was laying down watching videos when my boyfriend sat straight up, rambling gibberish mixed with numbers. I asked him what was wrong and if he was okay. He looked me dead in the eyes, screamed, and threw himself back and continued snoring. I asked him about it earlier today, and he has no memory of it. His grandfather is taking him to the doll shop to his tomorrow. Hopefully, all things go back to normal. My father passed away recently due to illness. Since then, me, my mother and my brother have had a few odd experiences around the house. All of us have heard footsteps between the hours of 4 to 7 a.m., a time he used to get up and watch TV when he couldn't sleep. Last Thursday, we heard the front door open, but when checking it, saw it was still closed. The day and the time lined up with the time he first returned from hospital. He used a CPAP machine for assisted breathing. This will not work unless you're wearing the mask and making use of it. Not only that, but the final time he went into hospital, the paramedics took it with them. 
A few days after he passed, my mom could hear it very clearly, coming from his bedroom downstairs. One night when I heard footsteps, I went to investigate. At the bottom of the stairs, there was a strong smell. His smell. His cologne, the smell of his cigarettes. It just smelled of him and it was almost overpowering. Last night, I got curious and I wanted answers. I received an advert for some EMF slash EVP detector app. Honestly, at first I was a complete skeptic. I've always believed in the supernatural, but I don't believe apps like that really worked. The EMF spiked to the bottom of the stairs where I'd had a previous experience. I then took it over to his chair and left it sitting there. The EMF went off the charts and it picked up the word angry. I even heard it clearly with the phone turned up. Safe to say, I sprinted upstairs and hid. I thought it might have been something other than my dad, but then I started praying that it wasn't me he was angry with. If he was, I begged forgiveness. But this morning, because it was still troubling me, I told my mom that I thought he'd spoken to me. I put the app back on and left it by his seat again. My mom had enough experiences in the past couple of weeks to not be skeptical. I moved all electronics away from my phone and turned the TV off. The EMF spiked once more, and this time, my half-brother's name came up on screen after we heard what sounded like one of my dad's wheezy breaths. We both went cold and were both immediately covered in goosebumps. I won't reveal the name that came up for the sake of anonymity and whatnot, but the brother that was mentioned was the one who hadn't spoken to him for nearly 30 years. He was the only child he never got to see again before he passed away. I'd been experiencing the feeling of being watched and felt very uncomfortable in my bedroom to the point I made my mum and dad switch rooms with me and my sister because I couldn't sleep at night. My sister, who we initially thought had an imaginary friend, but when we talked about it, she gave us some very specific details, which turned out to be about a girl who had died in the area we lived in. She also used to hide in cupboards because she was scared of something. My dad on several occasions would run up to my room because he could smell cigarette smoke in the living room when he sat by the window and my room was directly above the living room. So he thought I was smoking in my room. Other small little things happened, like things going missing, batteries draining super fast, the feeling of being pushed and watched. So we decided to invite my friend's mum over, who was a medium. Not the kind of an that announces it to everyone. She kept it to herself. We made sure we didn't tell her or my friend any of these details because we wanted to make sure that we weren't just told what we wanted to hear. We sat down in the living room and straight away, she said there were three spirits present in the house. We were confused because we only knew about one. She explained there was an elderly woman who was the strongest spirit and she was protecting us. We worked out it must have been our nana. We kept her ashes, so it made sense. She went on to explain that the other two spirits were related. One, a little girl, and the other was what seemed to be her father. The father was a very angry spirit, and he also smoked heavily, and he didn't like us being in the house. She explained that the little girl was abused by this father figure and would hide in the cupboard. All the pieces were fitting together. She went on to explain that there were two portals slash gateways in the house of which the spirits enter and leave. One of them being in the living room and the other being in my old bedroom. She explained that she could close the portals, but she would have to prepare before she could do so. My parents had to leave to go get my little sister from school, so she left as well. My friend stayed as we had plans to go out a little later on. So myself, my younger brother and her was left still talking. Me and my friend were about to go upstairs to get ready to go out and she screamed in pain and grabbed her arm when we saw she had a big scratch right down her arm. Then we heard a noise coming from upstairs as if someone was playing with the radiator at which point there was the loudest bang that actually scared the living daylights out of us. 
I was the one voted to go upstairs to check it out. I searched my room to see if anything happened. Then my brothers and there was nothing. I walked to my mum and dad's room and found every cupboard drawer, every drawer open wide. As soon as I saw it all open, everything slammed shut. I ran out of that room so fast. We all left the house and waited outside in the garden till my parents arrived. We clearly had agitated about something and we didn't want to stay there anymore. A couple of days later, my friend's mum came over to do her thing. My sister stopped talking to her friend. The odd things in the house stopped happening, but I'll never forget about that day. Due to a roommate bailing out on our lease, I was forced to shack up with a buddy of mine and his wife. It was a small two-bedroom apartment, but he welcomed me with open arms. They had a toddler that the second room was for, but they said she never goes in there and sleeps with them every night, so it was no problem to take the room for my own. A couple of weeks went by with no incident. However, I did notice the room was a good 10 degrees cooler than the rest of the house at all times. No problem. I'll just wrap myself up in the blankets. I've always been a heavy sleeper, so it takes me some time to wake up in the morning as I zombie around for a good hour first. One particular night, I woke out of my sleep and lifted my head up to adjust the pillow. As soon as I did, I noticed something in the far corner of the room. The entire room was lit with moonlight except for one dark silhouette of a human form standing in the corner staring at me. This figure had no features besides the dark outlining of a broad-shouldered man standing, watching. It may have been my grogginess, but he was very tall as well, with his head almost touching the ceiling. Due to being 90% still asleep, I didn't acknowledge what I had seen and fell back asleep on my newly adjusted pillow. The next morning, as I awoke to a much brighter sunlit room, I remember what I saw last night and the form standing in my room. After a quick glance at the same corner, I shrugged it off as a dream and went on with my life. A couple more months went by with no more shadowy figures staring at me, or at least that I was consciously aware of. I was going to be moving to my new place with my then girlfriend and we were just waiting for the lease to start. One night during that wait, I encountered the silhouette man one more time. The details of this encounter were exactly the same. I awoke, adjusted my pillow, saw the giant shadow staring at me, thought nothing of it, and drifted off to sleep. Once again, to repeat my encounter to the letter, I woke the next morning remembering what I saw and quickly darted my eyes to the corner. Okay, there has to be something to this. Moving day arrived, and I decided to tell my buddy, who was gracious enough to let me stay, my two encounters with the silhouette. His reaction surprised me. Yeah, our daughter doesn't go in there and just points to the room saying, scary man, scary man, when she gets close to her. He told me as if it was no big deal. After letting out a sarcastic, now you tell me, we continued with the move. I've never had a ghost experience before or after that. It's my only little talking point to others who are interested in the same paranormal stories as I am. His presence has always stuck in my mind, though. I even put him in one of my short horror stories when I first started writing. Of course, that story was fictional. This one is not. This is a story told by my uncle, who's a realtor. In his line of work, he often comes across houses like this that often people have died in, and some linger around. This one, though, had a lasting impression on him because of why it was the way it was. Initially, he told me about the house since we both had a sixth sense. He said there was this haunted house that he was in charge of, and if I wanted to see it, of course I was like, why not? It stoked my interest. But also, I made sure we weren't going in. I'm, I'm very superstitious. And I've never been attacked before. 
so I take care not to intrude with the other side even though I get interested. I don't want to cross lines. Didn't want anything to attach to me when he showed me this house and I saw it. I understand why the grandma felt the way she did. If you have a sixth sense, you'll understand when you see certain locations or places with bad history. You'll feel an off feeling, a darkness even in light, anger, sadness even, negativity and an overall sense of dread. This is what I felt from just staring at the house and then after he sent me this. The other day, I was scheduled to show two beautiful elk grove homes. One of them looked very familiar. I wasn't sure if it was the exact home I was thinking of. Unfortunately, on this day, my left ankle had been giving me a lot of trouble. You could say I was more concentrated on the sharp pain that runs up my spine with each painstaking step than paying any attention to the homes. Although I was suffering from this pain, I just pressed on with the job, showing these two homes. The first home was a home I told you that looked very familiar, but wasn't sure if it was the right home. As it turned out, it was the home I thought about. It was one of my friend's homes who had let it go into foreclosure a few months earlier. Because of my ankle pain, I didn't venture far into this giant beast. I only stayed in the living room with the client's grandma. We just stood there staring at each other while the rest of the client's family explored the entire home. The home shows very well, but there were lots of visible repairs needed in order to make it livable. There were loose and hanging wires throughout the house and floors that looked like it was damaged from the flood. Although the walls looked new, the home had a dark, creepy and depressing feeling to it. It was not your normal giant, whereas you walked in and you just have this exhilarant vibe of happiness and warmth. The grandma turned and looked at me. With an expressionless and stern face, she said, this home needs lots of repairs. That was all she said. My client's family couldn't agree more. It wasn't until the next home did the grandma finally open up to me. The grandma slowly said in a low tone, I like this home more than the last one. That first home gives me the creeps. I couldn't agree more. But to lay this creepy feeling to rest, I tried to justify the reason to the grandma why it felt creepy. I told her it must have just been because that first home was much bigger than the second one. Although I did get a creepy feeling about the first home, I probably chose to ignore the feeling. My hair for once didn't stand up, nor did I have this feeling there was someone lurking around like usual. This time it was more of, where can I get home to rest my foot? Maybe this was the reason why my sixth sense didn't kick in full force. I was more worried about the sharp shooting pain from my uncle than paying attention to the surroundings. However, just letting you all know, I didn't lose my sixth sense, not just yet. Like I said, I did get this creepy, dark and depressing feeling about the house, but my mind was somewhere else. Later on in the evening, I texted my friend and told her I showed her old home to my clients. She asked me how the show went. I told her the grandma said the home was creepy. The next text scared the wits out of me. She said, yes, the home is creepy. My late husband passed away in this home. I knew her husband was sick, but I didn't think he died inside the home. She's never mentioned it to me. She called me and told me the whole scary story. She said after he died, she continued to hear him call her name around one in the morning, telling her he was hungry. She thought it was her imagination at first. Maybe once or twice hearing her late husband call her name may be coincidental. But calling her name every night around 1am started giving her the creeps. Before her late husband passed away, he was bedridden. He couldn't walk, but could only crawl. After he passed away, she sometimes sees a glimpse of him crawling around the house. Late at night when she was in her room, she could feel and hear him crawl throughout the house, up the stairwells and into the hallway. Since there was a huge gap at the bottom of the bedroom door, she could feel him lay his head down on the floor and peek at her. Now those of you who have had such experience knows the person being haunted will experience a telepathy connection with the spirit. This person will see exactly what the spirit is looking at. While she was in her room, in the back of her head she could feel someone staring at her from underneath the door. Every move she makes, 
she could see herself from a third person's view. She couldn't shake the feeling off. She got so freaked out, she placed towels under the door every night. She told me she didn't want to tell her son, because it would really creep him out. This is the real reason why she decided to let her home go into foreclosure. Paying for the home was not a problem, she could afford it, but she couldn't stand that home any longer. She said she's never been so scared in her life. One of the cons of buying a foreclosed property is that the bank is exempt from disclosing deaths on the property. This is left up to the buyer to do their own due diligence about finding the history of the home. Although foreclosed homes may be sold for under market value, sometimes it's better buying a home from a seller. Sellers are required to dis disclose deaths on the property within three years. However, it is unfortunate. Unexplained phenomena or hauntings are not part of the disclosure package. This is where you may have to rely on your sixth sense. Buyers, beware. This happened around five years ago. I had just moved in with my grandma, trying to find some independence, as well as trying to help her be a bit better economically. The house is actually divided into three small buildings. So I had one of these just for me, while she and my grandpa used another one. All the three buildings were surrounded by a big chain link fence, so it's secured, but you can actually look into the backyard and such. It was my third night there, and my grandparents were out on vacation. I didn't feel secure or comfortable, but I brushed it off as the experience of being independent. To calm myself down a bit, I turned on the light of the bathroom and let the door open before turning off the lights in my bedroom, so I would still have plenty of light but it wouldn't bother my eyes. I managed to sleep for a few minutes before waking up a bit alarmed. I looked at the window and thought I saw someone standing there, but as soon as I blinked, they were gone. I laid down again and tried sleeping, but I woke up again, and when I looked at the window, I saw someone looking inside, but as soon as I got to turn on the lights, which were right over my bed, they were gone again. I got a bit scared, so I got out of my room and let the dogs in, since I knew that if someone tried to get inside, they would certainly make a lot of noise as they're trained to do so. I also made sure all the doors were locked and checked all the windows, and no one was there. So I felt a bit relieved and went back to my room. Since I didn't have an actual door in my bedroom, it was a cloth only, I had this little baby door that I used to keep my dogs out of the room, so I put it in place and went back to bed. Checking the windows again and turning off all the lights except for the bathroom one. I fell asleep but suddenly woke up again. This time I couldn't move, so I thought it was sleep paralysis. I looked around me and I saw something staring at me from the opening in the bedroom door. I was, to say the least, scared to death. I couldn't move nor make any sound, so I was just getting more desperate each second. I closed my eyes and repeated to myself that this was sleep paralysis over and over to try and calm myself down. When I opened my eyes, it was no longer there. I let out the air in my lungs that I was not aware that I was holding and realized that I could move at that moment. So I turned around, which was the worst decision I could make, because as soon as I did, I saw this thing looking directly at me. Oh well, I felt it looking at me, because it had no eyes, only holes. Its face was inches from me, its mouth open, just tons of black and gooey spikes inside it. I tried to turn around, but it grabbed my neck and pulled me. I screamed and it yelled back, the thing running outside my door and out. I passed out a few seconds later. In the morning, I woke up and thought it was all a bad dream, until I saw the baby door on the floor. I got scared but tried to think logically and said to myself that it probably was just the dogs who made it fall, not the thing that I saw, that it was just a coincidence. I left for work to try and have a normal day. While I was working, 
A friend of mine came and asked me, pretty worried, what had happened to me. I didn't understand this question, so he pointed at the back of my neck. I had two long cuts on the back, going from the middle of my neck to my ear. I was shocked, but I said to myself that again, probably it was just my dogs trying to jump on the bed. And since they scratched me, I had a nightmare about it. No big deal, right? Well, when I arrived at home that night, I had my front neighbour, who I've known since I was three, so pretty trustworthy, come to me a bit shy and looking a bit weird. When I asked him what was going on, he asked me if everything was alright. Once again I was shocked, but asked him what he meant, and I quote his answer. It's just, last night I was having dinner when I heard someone scream pretty loud. I came out and I saw someone running out of your house and into your grandma's place. I thought that maybe something happened to her. I felt the blood draining from my face. They were on vacation and there was no one else out the house. I told him I was fine and went back to my place. I couldn't sleep with the lights off for over three months. A lot happened after that. I lived there over a year, but this is the only one where I got physically hurt. A few weeks ago, my partner and I moved into a new luxury apartment with our two cats. We live in a major city near the beach. The apartment building was recently renovated, but has had previous tenants and the land has also been in use for hundreds of years for various purposes. We're on the sixth floor. The only thing I found in the apartment that belonged to prior tenants were folic acid supplements in the cabinet. Since the very first night we lived here, I've been having a strange experience with an entity. I've had some odd stuff happen before, but nothing quite like this. The first night I was still awake at about two in the morning and got up to go to the bathroom. Clear as day, I heard a deep male voice say, there you are. At first I thought our home was being invaded. That's how human-like and clear the voice was. But then I saw a shadowy entity in the hallway. It was very tall, vaguely humanoid and dark. Sort of like shadow but staticky almost. Pixelated. It seemed to be walking on the ground. I retreated back to the bedroom and got in bed. I saw the entity briefly enter the bedroom. Without opening the door, it just went through the wall. And then go back to the hallway. I thought I might have had a waking dream or something. I told my partner about it the next morning but we both shrugged it off. What's weird is, we were working from home the next day, and I saw it again. Standing in the hallway, still appearing shadowy, but this time in broad daylight. One of my cats who was next to me sat up and looked directly at it, which is what made me turn around to see it. Another cat walked around it the same way it would have walked around a human person. Around 2 or 3 a.m. every night, the entity walks the same pathway down the hallway, into the bedroom, then back through the hallway. During midday, it just sits in the hallway for 15 minutes or so, before disappearing again. It doesn't appear every day, but it does appear every night. Sometimes it speaks. It once asked, where are you going? When I turned around to go back to bed, it will otherwise not interact with me. It's never approached me or left the hallway slash bedroom entry. My partner can't see it. The cats continue to interact with it, look at it and meow at it. I was in fifth grade, sitting on my desktop computer, home alone after school. The desk fit into the little nook in my dining room so I could look left and see into the living room, but if I was leaning into the computer, there was a wall in the way. I was just playing games or something, and suddenly my front door burst open and there were shuffling footsteps going into my mom's bedroom. I froze and tried to push myself towards the computer so if it was an intruder, they couldn't see me behind the wall. After a few seconds of silence, the feeling of a cat rubbed against my leg dangling off the chair, and a loud cat meow surrounded me. Not like a normal meow, 
but like the sound of an angry cat and it was super duper loud. I had a cat at my dad's house, so I know what normal cats sound like, but this noise surrounded and echoed in the room rather than just coming from a foot off the ground. I pulled my foot up, looked down, and there was nothing there. I looked, the door was still open, and I just sprinted to my room. My mom was at work, so she called my grandpa to come over and check out the place. I think this was just after we were robbed, so I was extra paranoid about someone intruding. They said the door probably opened from the wind, but there was an enclosed porch on the other side of the door and a second door that opened out rather than in. But since we were robbed, we made sure the doors were locked, so I find it unlikely that the front door was unlocked and somehow just flew open without a breeze. The cat, I never got an explanation for that. We moved into that house not long after the woman who lived there before died. She had two cats, I believe. There was a little cat house in the backyard that we never touched. I'm not sure if she died in the house or not, but other weird things have happened. One time, I was sleeping, and the karaoke machine in my room randomly turned on to full volume. Other nights, I would hear pots and pans banging around in the kitchen, which was attached to my room. There was a plaque in the kitchen that said Jean's room, and never got taken down. Jean was the old lady that lived there before. For a good bit of my childhood, we lived in Charleston, South Carolina. Our neighborhood and house were not too old. The house was built in the mid-90s. However, the neighborhood was built on the grounds of an old slave plantation. This, I believe, is what led to experiences by my sisters and I. I don't have one cohesive story, but more a list of things we saw, heard, or felt. Our dad was in the military, so he'd be gone on trips all the time. When he'd get home, usually at night, we could hear him come up the steps and he'd open our doors, check on us, and then leave. One night, I heard what sounded like his boots on the hardwood flooring, but my door didn't open. I didn't think much. The next morning, I asked my mom when Dad got home, and she assured me he wouldn't be home for three more days. So I figured I was hearing things. The weird thing is... My two older sisters said they heard it too. This went on for a few nights randomly over a long period of time, but rarely whenever dad was home. There was one night that I remember vividly. I heard the sound clear as day, boots walking up the steps and on the hardwood floor. Dad had been gone for a few weeks, so I rushed up to see him. I opened my door and there was nobody there. One of my sister's rooms was beside mine. She heard footsteps and opened her door, thinking Dad was home too, but just found me standing there confused. Our older sister, who was at the end of the hall, then came out because she woke up to the footsteps and then heard us whispering. We were now convinced we had a ghost in the house. Our mom, whose bedroom was downstairs, woke up and yelled at us from the foyer because she thought we were stomping around upstairs. We told her what happened, and she said it was just a floor popping. Something not uncommon for hardwood flooring. We all went back to bed, and here's the kicker. Once we all closed our doors, the footsteps went back down the hall and down the steps. Again, clear as day. I didn't sleep anymore that night. We never saw anything, but always heard these phantom steps. Up the stairs, down the hall and then back, from all three of us at night to individuals when we were home alone. It became a joke in the house that we did have a ghost, and it was the ghost of someone from the plantation. Nothing ever seemed angry or evil, just off. Perhaps someone's just checking on the kids. This was when I lived in Charleston, South Carolina, on the grounds of an old plantation. I had a toy double barrel shotgun. It was modeled after the old side-by-side type. Two hammers, two triggers. When the triggers were pulled, it'd make a shooting sound. If held down, 
the shooting would go on. One night while sleeping, I hear the shooting sound, muffled, coming from my closet. I opened my toy chest where the gun was and took it out. As soon as I touched it, it stopped. I figured something had shifted and was pulling the trigger on the chest, so I laid it on top and went back to bed. A few minutes later, it started again. Now I was getting scared. I took it out and removed the batteries, thinking maybe there was something wrong with the wiring. Left it and went back to bed. Now I woke up again to the sound of clicking from the closet. I looked in and the two hammers were clicking back and firing repeatedly. This was my nope moment and I threw the gun away. After telling my dad, he simply said it must have been broken. For this one, I'd like to add that these take place in the early 2000s, so the show A Haunting was big at the time. One of my sisters and I were in my parents' room watching a sad show on an old TV. In the show, the woman was talking about how she was in her bed watching TV before going to sleep. Her lamp then flickered three times and the TV cut to a blue screen. As if on cue, my parents' bedroom light flickered once and the TV cut to blue then static, then normal. My sister and I ran out yelling. Our mom didn't believe us, but we assured each other it did happen. Took that as the ghost trying to communicate, maybe. Those were the two big ones involving me. We had other experiences as well. My older sister had a weird door that could lock from the outside. She had problems where the door was always locking and she'd be trapped in a room. Our mother tried very hard on our old mechanical keyboard on the computer upstairs. You could hear it downstairs because it was so loud. Scary thing is, we'd hear the sound while she was at work, with nobody upstairs. We had a radio in the living room that liked to turn on at the most random times. To turn it on, you had to hit a power button on it. No remote. Lastly, the access to one of the attics was a door in my bathroom. We stored some of my toys there. I always hated opening it up because I would always have the feeling of being watched and just dreading it. Weird sensation for a kid. That sums up my experiences I can remember, or what my sister does have shared. We believe they were two different ghosts, as when we heard the footsteps, we were never scared for some reason. It's made me a firm believer in ghosts, and it wasn't until recently that our mom has said she believed the house to be haunted. Our dad always denies it. So I was having an argument with my significant other and I started yelling at him. When I got angry, I shouted that I was going to leave him. The first time I did this, my door slammed shut in the bedroom and I thought it must have been a draft or something. And we laughed, thinking it was dramatic effect. And he went on to say the vibrations of my voice must have been so bad, the door couldn't take it. Anyway, since then we've bickered like any other couple. To fix the draft, we got stuff installed around all the windows and inside the house. A few weeks later, once again I'm in my room arguing with him and I tell him again that if he doesn't change, I'll leave and move back to my parents' house. This time I wasn't shouting. As soon as I said it, both my wardroom doors flung open and we both got scared. Again, if we put it down to draft, even though we both know this has been fixed. Moving on from that one night, I was having a nightmare and woke up in my sleep in the middle of the night, only to find straight after I woke, my significant other was also having a nightmare and he accidentally scratched me while he grunted and grit his teeth, arching his back backwards and trying to breathe. I thought he was having a seizure, so I turned on the light only to see that once again the doors were open in the room, both door and wardrobe. My significant other woke immediately after, and the only thing he said in a slurred speech was, it went out the window. The odd thing is, he doesn't remember any of it. He only remembers that he had a nightmare and can't remember what about. He only remembers me looking at him terrified in the middle of the night. As religious people, 
My dad's side of the family and I are strong believers in ghosts, demons, jinn, etc. Except my mom, who grew up in America in a non-religious household with a different cultural background. This is a collection of instances that happened to us in this condo. When I was about 16, two years ago, my dad's side of the family, around 13 of us, stayed in a beach condo in Alexandria, Egypt, where they live. These condos are known for being completely vacant the whole year and only being rented out for the three months of summer. In our culture, spirits inhabit empty places where they can live how they want. And this apartment was no different. We had rented it for five weeks up front, no refund. This is very expensive, and the main reason we didn't pack our bags and book it. After a couple of weeks, I assume the spirits became a little restless. First, one of my aunts, a cousin who's a year younger than me, and I started saying how we couldn't look in the mirrors in the main bathroom. They said they would see smoke coming out of their eyes and other mind tricks, and personally, I saw my eyes go black and truly felt that I was looking at someone who wasn't myself. Little things like that would start happening, like my uncle would complain about someone sitting at the foot of his bed when he's sleeping. No one would dare to get very angry when woken up. My aunt would feel someone pulling her hair, and doors would start slamming. The first time we interacted with them, however, was when my uncle knocked on the bathroom door and a woman clearly said, I'm in here, and his name, but the light inside was off. There was only a window to the elevator chute in that bathroom, so it was completely pitch black at night if the light isn't on. He hurriedly grabbed me and asked if anyone was in there. I counted everyone twice at his request, insisting it was empty and to just open the door. He refused, but I got an impatient myself opening it for him to find it empty. I had never seen him scared my entire life, and he sure as hell didn't use the bathroom. I was in that same bathroom one morning, and a woman's voice started talking to me in rapidly fast Arabic. I couldn't understand them, screamed my name. Looking back, I should have been terrified, but I was only left confused sitting on the toilet, wondering what was she trying to tell me. This experience is the one that made us all confess to each other on the fourth week that we'd been seeing and hearing. There were a lot of children in our family, and one of my cousins who was around 10 would take her mom's iPhone and take pictures of her little sister, who was around 5. My aunt, the mother of these two, regularly goes through her pictures, just in case one of them has a picture of someone changing, a house full of girls who share a room, and her husband usually goes through her phone. This time, she was looking through her trash folder and came across this picture that stopped her in her tracks. She ran from the bedroom, the picture was taken into the main living room, where we'd all been sitting and chatting to show us a picture of what was supposed to be her youngest daughter, mangled into at least five different faces, where her own was supposed to be. It wasn't a pano, but we thought maybe her oldest had screenshot a pano gone wrong, as other iPhone users know happens often. Not only could we not find a pano version anywhere, I tried recreating that same glitch for half an hour, to not get anything even close. She removed the picture from her trash to find an explanation and refused to give either daughter her phone. Two days later, neither daughter had been allowed and hadn't taken the phone. We were looking for the picture to show someone else and couldn't find it. She looked in the trash folder to see it sitting buried way before it was even taken. This kept repeatedly happening to every phone the picture had been sent to, and I even put it in my Google Photos, only for it to be deleted again and again. One morning, my grandma woke me up to someone shoving their finger in her mouth and wiggling it around. Her eyes shot awake, but no one was even in the room with her. This one is the scariest encounter in that condo. My mom, a total non-believer, had been on her own bed in only a towel after a shower, combing her hair, and had a clear view of the frosted glass. None of us had told her what had been going on with the rest of us, because she slept alone in a room with my younger sister, and knew she would just brush it off. It's around 8pm. My whole family had just finished dinner together, and were all in close proximity to the main bathroom, which was next to my mom's bedroom, 
both in clear view of the dining table. All the kids were in a bedroom at the other end of the condo, and my uncle was standing in the middle of this area, with his back to my mom's bedroom door, talking to my oldest aunt, who was facing him in the door. My aunt sees this long door handle to my mom's room, slowly turn down, and the door opens just a crack. In order to close this door properly, you had to slam it shut. So to open this handle, you need force. My aunt yells at me to check on my mom, not telling me why. I open the door to scold my mom for not closing it properly, when she looks at me like she's going to start screaming and crying. She tells me that she heard the door open, and then saw the figure of a small child in the frosted glass just watching her. To say the least, she's a believer now. We stayed the whole five weeks, each day getting worse and worse by the last two weeks. We're never returning to that place again, no matter how cheap. For context, I work in the offshore oil and gas industry, or oil field, and I work and live out in Asia. Here where I'm at, Oil and gas extraction quite often is done out at sea, often many miles away from shore. Often this is done by building large steel structures we call platforms, with legs that sit on the seabed and working platforms and decks above sea level, the house machinery. The wellheads sometimes need crew quarters. Typically, they'll have a large mother platform with living quarters for upwards of 100 people, with small unmanned satellite platforms nearby that link back to the mother platform by undersea pipeline. Usually, nobody stays at the unmanned satellites. They day trip from the mother platform instead. So most of the time, the unmanned satellites are truly bereft of human presence. It's on one of these unmanned satellite platforms that our story takes place. I was part of a crew sent to a satellite platform to perform some well-servicing work maybe 10 years ago. Our crew consisted of 20 guys, 10 day, 10 night, and there were another three guys from the mother platform, we'll call them the production crew, staying on the satellite with us. Since there wasn't any real accommodations at the satellite, my crew were all staying on board a nearby supply boat. The production guys were day slash night trip over from the nearby mother platform, about a one hour boat ride away. Oh, and this platform was close to 30 years old, showing its age. By the time I got on location, the project was already a month in progress. We'd had numerous problems so far. Equipment failures, breakdowns, stuff not going to plan, etc. Which was rather more than the usual. Our mechanic and electrician were both pissed off. Stuff that they'd fixed with brand new spare parts were breaking again. Things that shouldn't break down, broke down, etc. The job itself was going rather poorly as well. All in an unusual streak of very, very bad luck. We really didn't think much of it at first. We were so busy with the work. When one morning, the supervisor was apologising to one of the production guys about the latest breakdown. When the guy left and said that it was normal for this platform, every contractor, every crew who has ever worked on this particular platform always had massive streaks of bad luck there. Weird, huh? Anyways, that's just the mild stuff. What really takes things up several notches happened at night. I was on the night shift crew. There was a smoking area at the lowest deck of the platform, just above the sea, next to the toilet. There was an older guy, let's call him Uncle Jack, who usually took his smoke breaks alone. The rest of us would go down in twos or threes, but Uncle Jack was the quiet type who liked his little me time breaks. One day, he stops his solitary smoke breaks, always insisting for someone to accompany him, else he wouldn't go down alone. He's a heavy smoker, so him being able to hold it sometimes for an entire night was unusual. Only much later, he told us why. One night, he was on his solo break, leaning against the railing with a cigarette in one hand, when he felt a tug at his elbow. He turned and saw nothing. He was alone. Shrugging it off, he took another long drag on his cigarettes, when suddenly something grabbed him hard by both shoulders and yanked him backwards, as if to pull him into the sea. Uncle Jack reeled but managed to catch himself from falling. 
his cigarette falling into the dark waters churning below. He was so shaken by that ordeal that he never took solo smoke breaks again on that job. That's not all. A number of the guys reported seeing a figure, sometimes white, sometimes dark, lurking around the cellar deck. They said they'd seen it sometimes hanging around in a corner, or climbing up or down the staircase to the sea deck. The cellar deck was a favourite resting spot for our crew, because it was cool, shaded, and relatively quiet, so perfect for taking a short nap during breaks in the work. Two of my friends, Bob and Mac, were taking a nap one night at the cellar deck, Bob suddenly awoke with this terrible itching all across his face and neck, suddenly disappearing as soon as he got up. He looked over at Max, sleeping sadly next to him, and woke him up too, afraid there might have been a chemical or gas leak. Max said he didn't feel a thing, but to be safe, they checked out the area and found nothing. Settling back into their nap, this time Mac was awoken with the same itching all across his face. Waking up Bob, Again, they found nothing and went back to sleep. This time, both of them felt that crawling, itching sensation again. This time, they knew it was something else. When they told me the story later, I laughed and mentioned the figure that the others had seen in that area, saying maybe that they felt was the figure's long hair dragging across their faces. The look in their eyes as the colour drained from their faces said it all. It was exactly the feeling of long hair tickling their faces. We have a belief here that in places with little to no human presence, that other entities tend to make their homes there, and we humans become trespassers on their territory. That theory was soon proven to us. At the time I was on that platform, the rainy season had just begun. Heavy torrential downpours that would happen every morning without fail, sometimes up to several times a day. Thunderstorms at sea are a thing to marvel at, an approaching solid wall of rain and darkness, which soon envelops you on all sides until you cannot see anything beyond a couple hundred metres. When the storms hit our tiny platform, you couldn't even see the gigantic plume of flame from the mother platform's flare stack, which normally lights up the sky for a mile or so around. And yet, despite the raging storm that beset us on all sides of our tiny little platform, up on the top deck, it would be dry as though the storm parted around the little platform, held back by whatever entity resided there. The Watcher on the platform. A wellhead, aka Christmas tree, is a set of valves and manifolds sitting atop an oil or gas well that serves to cap the well and provide a way to control the flow of the oil or gas out of the well, in a nutshell. One time, I was on a three week long job on a large mother platform, where we set up our equipment on a small adjacent satellite platform connected to the mother platform via a bridge. I was on the night shift with one other guy. Part of the job involved recording the readings every hour from a pressure gauge on the wellhead of the well we were working on Well, number 12. This was one deck below the top deck, in what we call the wellhead bay, where the wellheads are clustered very tightly. You have to squeeze through the various pipes, manifolds, instruments, etc. to reach number 12. All went well at first, nothing out of the ordinary, except it was a bitch to take the gorge reading since it was a tight squeeze. Me being smaller than the other guy was the natural choice for the task. Only thing is, during the night at least, it was kind of weird in the wellhead bay. There were maybe only a total of five people on duty at night, including three platform guys sitting in the control room of the mother platform, so there's hardly anyone around at all. 99% of the time, I would be the only guy down there at any time. However, I would always get a weird feeling, like there was someone nearby. Hard to explain. Plus, I'd get goosebumps whenever I stood in front of the pressure gauge at wellhead number 12. A couple of times, I thought I heard someone calling my name, but there was no one around. One of the day guys gave me a cryptic warning one evening during shift handover. Don't go down to the wellhead bay alone at night. He wouldn't say any more than that. But come on, what could I do? 
There were only two of us, and one had to stay up top to monitor the equipment at all times. So I just took it in good faith that he meant it from a safety and buddy system perspective, and assured him we'll be fine. Didn't think much of it at the time, and the job went on fairly well. A week later, back in base, I was chatting with a couple of colleagues, and the topic of fatal work accidents was brought up. One of them said he was on a job where a young greenhorn got himself killed installing a pressure gauge on a wellhead. He'd forgotten to check for pressure in the wellhead before loosening a bolt. And when the bolt was loosened, it shot out and hit him square in the forehead, killing him instantly. Ever since then, many people had reported feeling uneasy at the spot where the young guy had died. I asked, where did this happen? On the platform, right in front of the pressure gauge of wellhead number 12. My maternal grandma, whom I was really close to, passed away in 2003. When she was alive, she was very fond of using creams like deep heat and counter pain, so she always had this lingering scent of menthol wherever she went. She regularly stayed at our home, other times staying with one of my numerous uncles or aunts. After she passed away, we gave away her old clothes, cleared out her old medicines and creams, etc., since nobody else in our house used them. Anyway, fast forward to a few months later. I was having dinner with my parents and siblings when we were talking about old grandma, how we missed her and joked about how she always had that menthol smell around her that we no longer had in the house. Then suddenly, my mum went quiet. My dad went quiet. Then the rest of us went silent. Finally, my mum asked, who's been using deep heat cream? We all looked at each other and we all knew that none of us had used it or even had it in the house. And in that instant, we all knew that all of us had caught a whiff of that familiar, old, comforting menthol scent. After a few minutes, though, it was gone. It was as though Grandma had popped by to let us know she missed us too, and she was still with us. None of us felt any fear in that moment, just an odd sense of comfort. A few times after that, we would sometimes catch a whiff of the familiar menthol scent, and we'd know Grandma had maybe popped by to check in, on how we were doing. So when my dad was young, his dad, my grandfather, let's call him GP, worked for a bit as a lumberjack. There was a young guy who lived in the same village whom my dad knew, a pretty cocky guy, so let's call him C. One day, C decided to join the lumberjacks to earn some money. According to my dad, C was pretty cocky and loved to run his mouth, making snarky comments about stuff, always acting like a smart aleck when the other guys tried to teach him stuff. Things went all right for a while, but one fateful day, C met his comeuppance. The crew was in a tropical rainforest, cutting down trees. As they finished cutting down a tree, they stopped for a water break in the heat and humidity of the jungle. C wandered off to take a leak. It wasn't long before he came running back, calling everyone to go with him. He brought them to this massive tree where, nestled amongst the gnarled roots, rested a human skull. The guys immediately hushed up and decided to leave things be. Nothing good could come of disturbing someone's resting place, and especially under a massive old tree. There's a belief that really old, huge trees have guardian spirits residing in them. Hence, Extra care must be taken when felling or working on one of these. See, the smart aleck as always laughed it off and called everyone else superstitious old fools, saying if they cut this tree down, they'd get good money for it. The guys were having none of it. GP told C to cut it out and come back to work. They still had logs to cut and prepare for hauling. Seeing nobody pay him any attention, C decided he needed to pull a stunt to prove his manliness. Whipping out his trash snake, he called out to the guys, watch this, and took a piss at the foot of the tree, aiming carefully to make sure he got the skull full blast. How was that? How's the taste of my piss? C asked smugly, looking at the skull. Tastes a bit salty, came the reply. Whirling around, C laughed. <laughs> 
<laughs> Who said that? Only to see the rest of the crew, disgusted at his antics, already trudging back to work. Thinking nothing of it, he shrugged and went back to join the guys. The fun really started the next time C took a piss. Tastes a bit salty, the voice would boom in his ear. At first, C thought it was one of the guys playing a prank on him, although everyone denied saying or even hearing anything. Tastes a bit salty, the voice would boom in his ear again. Every time C took a piss, in his home, at work, at the coffee shop, no matter where he went, the faithful piss connoisseur would follow. It didn't take C for long to realise that he had ticked off the wrong being, and that this being had attached himself to him. C ranted and screamed at everyone around him, desperately trying to prove that it was someone playing a mean prank on him, but the voice was for his ears only. Eventually, though, C went mad. The whole village had heard of his exploits and chastised him for it, even going so far to use C in his example to teach their kids to respect nature and the supernatural. C desperately tried to fix the problem, seeking out temples, spirit mediums and the like, only for them to either tell him that they couldn't do anything about C's new friend, or refusing to help and that he deserved it. C eventually took his own life. A bit salty to the end. Tastes a bit salty, wouldn't you agree? I work in the offshore oil and gas industry, oil field for short, and the work that my crew and I do often has us working with our equipment set up on board ships called offshore supply vessel slash boats owned by another company. Also, I live and work in Asia. We normally have a crew of 15 to 20 people on the job site at any given time, and we don't have specific shifts like day or night. We just work whenever the requirement arises, or the client requests, day or night. In most cases, this means we'll be working 24 to 36 hours straight. The story. This one time, the client engaged our company to charter a supply boat and set up our equipment on board to do a job at an offshore drilling rig. Our equipment is huge, 800 horsepower, 20 feet by 8 feet large diesel driven units each and pretty much occupied the whole deck of the boat. Things started up normally. We set up the equipment, took a week's hard work, sailed out of port, got to the drilling rig on schedule. There was some other operational stuff going on, so we waited on standby near the rig for a couple of weeks, floating about and killing time. This is where the fun starts. I mentioned earlier we had about 15 guys on my crew, and there were another 20 guys who made up the boat's crew. Plus, the boat isn't that huge, so there's always another human being probably within shouting distance. It started the night we got on location. At breakfast, a couple of my guys were sitting all zombified and exhausted. They said they had a bad bout of sleep paralysis. Now, this can happen occasionally, especially, or should I say as a result of, really hard physical exertion for prolonged periods. So the moment you collapse and have a good deep rest, your body can, in fact, experience what seems to be sleep paralysis. Yeah, no biggie. Since we just spent a whole week, day and night rigging up heavy equipment and piping, we shrugged it off, went back to sitting around shooting the breeze. After all, we had a couple of weeks of nothing to do on standby, so with plenty of rest, it wouldn't happen again. We were wrong. The next night, a few other guys got it. Then the following night, a few other guys experienced it too. And every single night, random guys experienced it. There was no pattern. There was no exception. Eventually, everyone had experienced it. Some reported being able to open their eyes and seeing a dark figure pressing down on them in their bunk beds. A couple more religious ones tried reciting prayers during the episodes, only to have the choking, pressing feeling intensify. Morale was taking a beating. Isolated cases in the past we could laugh off, since there was a reasonable explanation and correlation to the physical work we did. This time, something was very wrong. The whole crew was getting it, and we literally had zero physical work at all. Still, we gave each other what moral support we could to get through the days and nights. And in the mornings, 
we knew. The tired, drawn expressions, the sunken eyes, the dark circles. We knew who it had come for the previous night. That's not all. If you've worked offshore, you'll know sometimes standby time is the hardest, because you quickly run out of ideas to pass the time. So we got busy, found things to do, started running through the preventive maintenance and startup checks in our equipment, running the units, so that at the moment we got the green light from the client, we would be ready to go full throttle. It came at us there too. Strange sounds on deck, amongst the equipment, I was on deck one evening after dinner, with five other guys working on one of the diesel engines. Suddenly, a huge metallic boom rang out from the aft deck. It sounded like someone took a ten pound sledgehammer and slammed it into one of the metal bunkheads. I got up to go check it out, thinking it might have been a loose lube oil drum or one of those units not being shimmed properly. The supervisor grabbed my arm and said, not now, tomorrow. In daylight. I was about to protest, but seeing the look in his eyes, I backed down. In the morning, me and the other guys went to check the aft deck. Nothing. Equipment skids were shimmed tight, everything secured tight as it should be. And the previous night, there was nobody at the aft deck area. But every night from then on, the same boom, the same place, without fail. Another thing, the vessel's crew refused to say anything when asked about these things. Sure, they were friendly and great guys to work with, but when this topic came up, they simply clammed up tight. And weirdly enough, they also absolutely refused to ever come out on deck after nightfall. Daytime was fine, they'd help with any request at all, but after dark, nope. Want a spare part from the deck store during the day? Fill out forms, wait outside while the bosun goes and gets it for you. Nobody goes inside my store. After dark, it's a free-for-all. The deck crew, not even the fussy bosun, would come out on deck. Go ahead and take what you need yourselves, just fill in the logbook. The final straw came once it was time to finally get to work. For context, we had an electrician who's a white American, Jack. Awesome guy, chill as fuck, skeptical when it comes to weird happenings, he was the one guy on the crew who could laugh off everything that happened and said we were imagining things. So in a way, he helped us keep our sanity. Important for later. The job starts. The big diesel units are running at full throttle. Listen to the 3000 horsepower choir sing. Everyone is giving it their all and we're done in about 24 straight hours. Clients happy, time to sail home. Crew shuts down the equipment pats each other on the back and heads to the locker room. It's about 2am at this point. Wait, where's Jack? Jack was curled up in a ball in the locker room, in a tiny gap between the lockers and the wall. A mound of cigarette butts on the floor at his feet. Rocking back and forth, chain smoking furiously. He doesn't chain smoke. Pale, shaking, eyes wild and muttering over and over again. What the fuck, man? What the fuck did I just see? What the fuck was that thing? We heard what happened from our mechanic. He was with Jack at the aft deck, near the railing, when they both saw a white, man-sized bundle fall from the drilling rig. Jack up rig, 30 metres dropped from the rig floor to sea level, and into the sea with a loud, audible splash. Hang on. These guys are standing right behind the diesel engines, 140 decibels loud, with earmuffs on, and they heard a splash. Jack was really excited, thinking it might be a man overboard, wanting to throw him a life ring and jump in to save him. When the mechanic grabbed Jack, pulled him back from where he was about to climb over the railing, and dragged him backwards, Jack started to argue when they saw something moving in the water. For context, it's dark, midnight. We're out on the open sea. The sea is choppy. If any one fell into the sea in these conditions... Good luck to you. This thing they saw, it was submerged and coming towards the boat, making a V-wave as it came. Jack continued arguing as if entranced that it was a man overboard. He needed to rescue the person and started climbing the rail again. The mechanic slaps him and says, Jack, whatever that is, it's not human. We're fucking going now. Next thing we know, we found Jack huddled in the locker room out of his damn mind. 
couldn't even muster a coherent sentence. Took him a couple of days to regain his composure after that incident. Thankfully, the journey back to port was short, 20 hours sailing time. We were all too motivated to disassemble all the equipment as soon as we reached the shore and get the hell off that boat in record time. When I was a child in elementary school, I saw a ghost. I lived in an old farmhouse in the cornfields of Ohio with my mother, father, brother and various animals. To help explain a little, I'll try to tell how the house was set up. It was close to the road with a gravel driveway. The front door faced the street, but most of us used the side French doors that we built a deck off of. The French doors opened into a big dining slash entry room. To the right was our only bathroom and to the left was the living room. The only time we used the front door was when we headed out to the bus and when my mom left for work on the days that a friend would pick her up. The front door opened up into the living room and was next to the stairs. On the other side of the stairs on the first floor was my brother's bedroom. You go up the closed stairs and on either side at the top were the other two bedrooms. On the left was mine and on the right was my parents. I cannot remember how I got woken up. I'm a light sleeper and would usually wake up to the sound of my mom getting ready for work. She had to get up at 4.30 every morning because she worked at a factory over an hour away. So that's how I knew this all happened. I do remember my stomach being upset. So I went across a small hall and told my dad. He said to just lay in bed with him, try to relax and get some sleep. After a while of doing that and hearing my mom get ready downstairs, I was starting to fall asleep. I remember hearing a car pull up out front. My mom slamming the front door shut because she locked the door handle and that's how you had to shut it. So I knew the door was locked. Then a car door slammed shut and finally the car drove away. I can't say how much time passed after that as I was drifting in and out of sleep but I really didn't think it was too much because I thought my mom had forgotten something. But I heard the side French doors open and shut. Still thinking this was my mom, I figured I'd hear some hurried motions and her rush out of the door again, but I didn't. I heard nothing. After a minute or two, the stairs started to creak. It sounded like a normal walking pace of someone who was quietly trying to make their way up, but not hiding their presence. All the while, my dad was fast asleep still. I feel like you know the house you grew up in very well. I knew those stairs and the sounds they made. There was one stair in particular that was halfway up that made a louder creaking sound than the others. So when I heard that, I knew they were almost to the top of the stairs. Then the part that made me think I was in a dream state. I heard what sounded like a st they stepped on a piece of paper on the stairs like a loosely balled up piece of paper being stepped on. Weird, I know, but I'll always remember that part and think how odd it was. I was laying on my side facing the window the entire time. The window that overlooked my driveway. So I would have seen or heard my mom going down the driveway if she came in through the side doors. Finally putting the pieces together that this wasn't my mom, I turned over, looked across the room at the door and saw someone walk in. There was a nightlight by the door and they stood in front of it. I heard their feet shuffle on the carpet. They were tall and I saw the glint of glasses. There were no features or colours, just a shadow. It had a square looking head. I didn't see its legs but it appeared to be wearing a nightgown so it was just a blob of shadow. I propped myself up on my elbows terrified and saw the nightlight shining through it. It just stared at me. I was so scared I couldn't move or speak. I have no idea how much time had passed, us just staring at each other. Eventually, it just walked out. Didn't go back down the stairs, didn't open or shut any doors, just left down the hall. I finally collapsed onto the bed and tried to wake my dad and was quickly dismissed. My only thought was they must have gone into my room. When it was time for all of us to wake up and get ourselves ready for the day, I told my dad and brother what had happened and my brother said he used to see the square-headed man too at the end of his bed when his bedroom was in mine. 
My mom later told me that it was her grandpa because she used to see glimpses of someone walking from her room to mine when she passed the stairs. And he wore glasses and a fishing cap that made his head look square. Now we just think that he was only checking in on us. I never slept in that room again all the way we moved when I was 12. That was the last time I saw him, but I can't say the same for my dad. He saw him years later, in another house we all moved to. I was freshly out of high school when we had a bad ice storm and had no power for a week. My mum and dad fell asleep in the living room, dad in his chair and mum across from him on the couch. As he woke up, he saw a man standing over her, watching her. He didn't see a face, but knew by the shape it was that old man. He disappeared as soon as he knew my dad was looking at him. That's just one of many times I've experienced a ghost sighting. This happened a few years ago on a camping trip, but it feels like yesterday. Me and my friend, both teen girls at the time, were sleeping a few yards from her aunt's trailer in a little tent. After goofing off for a while, we settled down. I faced one side of the tent, she faced the other. I was just starting to fall asleep when I could tell a bright light was illuminating the tent. You know how you can tell the lights are on, even when your eyes are closed? Assuming it was a car or something of the sort driving by, I kept trying to sleep. I heard an odd scratching sound as well, but didn't think much of it. I felt my friend tap my shoulder, but for some reason thought she had just rolled over while sleeping and had done it by accident. Finally, after another tap to the shoulder, I slowly and quietly turned to face her side of the tent. There was an incredibly bright light, brighter than any flashlight I've seen, pointing straight at the tent. There was only one point of light, so it couldn't have been a car. The best comparison I could draw was a motorcycle, but we would have heard a motorcycle approach the tent, or any vehicle for that matter. This wasn't the scary part though. It looked as though some kind of hooked saw-like object was being dragged slowly against the fabric of the tent, and made very much visible by the abrasive light, but we couldn't see anything holding it up. Then the light just switched off and we didn't hear or see anything else that night. When we worked up the courage to book it a few yards to the trailer her aunt was in, we didn't see anyone or anything out of place outside. After we got inside, she told me that before I had turned around to look at whatever she had seen, multiple shapes similar to the weird hooked saw thing were very clearly dragged against the tent, still with nothing seeming to hold them up. All equally terrifying and sharp looking, but nothing like I'd ever seen. Looked like the contents of a toolbox from hell. Over the last year, I've had a handful of recognisable brushes with something that just doesn't like me. The feeling is mutual. A year ago, my girlfriend invited me to move in with her full time. I'd stayed over before for a weekend. Nothing seemed off about the place or the living arrangement. I didn't get goose pimples or a sense of dread when I roamed around the place. Shortly after her invitation, I chose to move in with her. She was rather insistent that I move in immediately. I decided just to pull up stakes and find a job in the area after I moved in. This meant I spent most of the day alone in the house. It took a lot longer than I thought it would to get an entry level job in the area. After a while, I took laying in bed for an hour or two out of the day. That's when I started to notice strange no noises. They sounded like radio commercials and music, though I could never quite make out what was said. The voices and the tones of males and females, but all I could hear was garbled nonsense. Just recall radio commercials for local businesses, interspersed with semi-discordant music, and you're probably close to the mark. A little while after that, I started having vivid, jarring dreams. In one, I was holding an infant, then I had a seizure, and started squeezing the baby. I couldn't let go, and it had a horrified look on its face. That woke me up, and once I could go back to sleep, I was hit with another. The next one came 
as soon as I went back to sleep. I was standing in a backyard. Then I heard a young children's panicked screaming. I ran inside just to see a toddler aged child running out of the front door with an infant slung over their shoulder. I got to the toddler and infant in the driveway where the toddler dropped the baby. The baby started vomiting a large amount of green fluid. I woke up just as I picked up the infant and went to call for medics. Immediately upon waking, I clearly heard every small homeowner knows, and it faded away. We didn't have a radio or television on. It seemed like the same kind of commercial mimicry, but with more clarity. On another night, I woke up to a hard slap on the side of my head. I saw my girlfriend standing over me with tears running down her cheeks. She disappeared when I yelled, why the hell did you hit me? To which my girlfriend, laying next to me all along, sleepy stated, I didn't hit you, what are you talking about? A couple weeks after that, my girlfriend went to bed earlier than I. I was on my computer in the finished basement, almost directly under the bedroom. After a few hours, she messaged me and asked me to come upstairs. She said it sounded like there was a block party outside and she heard people talking outside the window. If there had been anything like that, I would have heard it as well. I heard nothing of the sort, whilst in pretty much the same side of the house. The neighbourhood had been quiet all night, for me at least. We resolved to move the bed, just in case we were picking up radio broadcasts or some other odd signal. She had heard the same things as well before I moved in. The adjustments seemed to significantly cut down on the odd commercial noises, though I noticed them for a couple of seconds, especially when tensions between her and I were elevated. Over the coming months, there was a host of other small odd occurrences. After the basement became unnaturally cold, I began to feel like I wasn't alone. I would catch brief glimpses of a naked man facing away from me in the basement. I had a general feeling I wasn't welcome. The worst instance happened when I was in the middle of remodeling the basement half bath. I went from sweating to practically freezing in an instant. I felt like something was standing just behind and off to the side, with about as much directed menace as I'd ever felt. I'm not religious, but I started naming as many saints as I could remember while I finished my process. Then I got the hell out of there and decided I would stream some games from the basement PC to the upstairs television while my girlfriend slept in. I started having all kinds of bandwidth problems, then somehow I was signed out of my account. To my knowledge, that needs to be done manually. Shortly after that, she woke up from a bad dream. She was with her mother, and they came back to her mother's house to find the door ajar. They found her cats had been messily slaughtered, and fed to dogs with various anti-Semitic epithets sprayed painted onto them. All throughout this time, our relationship deteriorated. I kept waking up in the middle of the night, flailing. I felt under attack. One night, I bashed my hand on the nightstand. Another night, I woke up outside, fully clothed. She said I was acting like a lunatic. It all became too much for me, and I moved out. I worry about her, so we still keep in contact. Yet another strange thing happened last night. We were talking on the phone, but I eventually became too tired and fell asleep. She stayed on the line, because listening to me sleep helps calm her. When I woke up, we were disconnected. I checked my messages and she wanted me to call her back. I clearly called her back and started to go back to sleep. I heard a faint voice on the line, which I brushed off as some podcast on her tablet until she started responding to me. I picked up a bit and heard a voice that sounded like mine, though I couldn't make out what was being said. I asked her who she was talking to, which confused her. She thought she was talking to me. I asked her what the voice said to her, and she said it sounded like me asking her if she was doing okay, if she had found a job. I told her I'd said nothing, though I had heard something that sounded like me. Naturally, this unsettled her, as we both know something is wrong in the house. I don't know if there's something in the house itself, or if it can be tied to a certain relic she has. It's a Chukwe tribe from Angola mask which symbolizes a mother being separated from her child as he enters manhood. 
I've urged her to donate it to some curator, as there are several in the area. The tribe itself is known to use their crafts as commodities, so I can't be certain about that angle. Though I know something in that house is disruptive, and loves to do it. To begin, I have this recurring dream that I've been having since middle school. I have it one or two times a year, but it's slowed down since I've gotten older. In the dream, I'm at home, but it isn't my house. It's a big two or three story home that's shaped like a U. Never seen anything like it before. I go upstairs to my mom's room in this dream and she's on the bed, seizing. My first thought is that she must be possessed. I call my brother in a panic and tell him mom is possessed. He just asks me if we need more bread or milk because he's grocery shopping. We fight back and forth. He refuses to listen. And I eventually hang up and try to help my mom myself. Before I can do anything, she stops seizing and looks out the window. I run to the window that overlooks the pool in the middle of the U. I see a spirit flying into the pool. I don't hear anything, but I know his name is Chris. My mom is fine again. It's a weird dream to keep having, but I never thought too much of it. Moving forward to when I was in college, there was a Ouija board that had been on the game shelf of my house for as long as I can remember. None of us have ever touched it or played it, but it's always been there. I asked if I could take it with me to college. I thought it would be fun for my friends and I to use. I've been very interested in the paranormal, but never really believed in it. I take it, and the first time I use it, I ask if it knows me. It says yes. I ask how. It spells mama. I disregard it. My friends use it several times after that. Nothing particularly interesting really happens in the hundreds of other uses. One night, a few years later... My family is all sitting in a hot tub late at night, in late fall in our backyard. We were just looking at the stars, but my little brother suggested we tell ghost stories. No one could come up with any, so we started talking about weird dreams and the meanings behind them instead. I offered to share mine, as I recently had one that I had several times before. I tell this dream to my family, and my mom and dad turn their necks so quickly to look at each other, I swear I hear them crack. I ask them what's wrong and they say Chris is just someone from their past. They act awfully strange for a bit before my mom says that she does actually have a ghost story. When my parents were teenagers and still dating, my mom bought a Ouija board, the same one I took with me to college. She convinced my dad to use it with her and they had fun asking questions about their future and whatnot. They ask several questions about their future and specifically, if they'll ever have their own cars. It answers Grand Prix. They ask for the name of the ghost they were speaking to, and it said Christopher. They didn't really play with it again due to the just lack of interest. Several months after their first experience, my mom buys her first car. Lo and behold, it's a Grand Prix. I think the fact that the Ouija board predicted that was a realization they had several months after the purchase. Could be chalked up to subconscious, but a little weird. I'll refer to my mom as M from here on. Several months after the car, my parents are visiting friends in another state. They're there for a Super Bowl party, I think. They're out of snacks for the party, so my mom offers to drive to the store and get some. Now, my mom has always been a big fan of personalised license plates. So of course, her Grand Prix had a license plate that said M's GP. She goes to the grocery store, and the bag boy helped her carry her groceries to the car. They're loading them into the truck, and he sees her license plate. Is your name M? Yeah, it's my Grand Prix, why? My friends and I were playing with a Ouija board the other night, and it just kept saying, where M? Where M? She did not talk any long with the bag boy, or exchange any kind of information. Now to top things off, I'm working at my first job after college. I've been here for nearly two years, and only a few weeks ago did I realise the building I work in is three storeys tall and shaped like a U. It's nearly identical to the one from my dream, 
save for the fact there's a courtyard instead of a pool in the centre. I'd love to hear any thoughts. It definitely feels like someone is looking for my mom and now going through me to find her. I don't know if it's worth noting, but my mom also seems to have sort of a sixth sense. She has dreams about people in strange rooms before they die. She's run into someone in the grocery store and thought, he doesn't seem well, weeks before he's diagnosed with cancer and was outwardly 100% fine and normal. And she told me that, that a few times as a child, she's been so angry with someone bullying her brother, she can't stop thinking about how much she hates them and they've died shortly after. As a kid, I used to always see shadow figures, no matter the time of day. I still see them to this day, but not as much as I did back then. But being older now and with the greatness of sharing on social media, one thing out of the many other shadows I used to always see was what I called the hat man. Funny enough, that's what he was actually called by others. But mine looked a tad different to pictures online or what others have drawn. Besides being a shadow figure that everyone else sees, he was a tall, eight to nine foot figure. who had a tall top hat as well, sort of like Abraham Lincoln's. He would have to bend his body in order to fit in my room, sometimes in very disfigured ways. Most times, I couldn't figure out if he was bending backwards or hunched forward at times. I could also slightly make out his clothing. He wore like a suit with a bow tie and trench coat. His arms were also ridiculously long. They went slightly past his thighs. Looking it up now and reading about him out of curiosity, the only things I've found about him are sleep paralysis. But the thing is, I never was in any paralysis when seeing him. I could move perfectly. I know this because I was so terrified at times, I would run to my parents and sleep with them for the night or turn away and hide under my covers if I knew I'd get in trouble for waking my parents up. It was almost an every night basis of me seeing things and crying. Sometimes I'd have trouble sleeping and look in the corner of the room and he would just suddenly appear. I've also experienced sleep paralysis plenty before when I was older and what I experienced then, not being able to make a sound or cry, the inability to move, wasn't anything like that when I would see him. I would also see him during the day, not as much at night, in dim rooms or in shadowed places. A few times when I was older, 14 to 15, he followed me around a bit, hiding behind corners or objects. A little background first. I'm sensitive and have seen ghosts, spirits, demons and unknown things. I currently have a 10 month old daughter. She's been walking the last few weeks pretty well and sooner than other babies around us. Her crib is still in our bedroom next to my side of the bed. It's a proper crib with the mattress lowered so she can't fall out and can stand up. There's a nightlight at the foot of her crib that is always on. In the middle of the night, we're all asleep. I wake up to something brush my face lightly. Felt like maybe air? Anyways, I open my eyes a little confused why I'm awake. I lightly hear my baby whispering and lightly laughing. I open my eyes and look around. I see her walking next to the bed. Wobbly holding on the side of the bed in crib to balance. She hasn't had to hold on for a few weeks. I'm scared, thinking she must have fallen out of her crib somehow and is hurt. Did I think maybe I slept in? Her husband took her out and let her wake me. I'm starting to sit up and she starts walking back towards my way, closer to the head of the crib. She keeps looking inside the crib excited and lightly laughing and whispering. I hear how my husband snoring behind me and realise something is wrong. I sit up a little and get ready to pick her up to check her, make sure she's not hurt. However, she escaped. That's what I noticed. I could see her sleeping inside the crib. I sit up all the way and throw my blanket off. The baby is now with its back to me at the head of the crib. I yell, what the fuck? It turns, looks at me and walks into the wall. It had no face, just a blur. 
Now I'm mad. And yell, what the fuck again? Check my daughter. She's fine, sleeping. I get up and bless the whole room with holy water, then go back to bed. Sleeping peacefully now, I've woken up again. Now there's a light laugh and noise back again. By the foot of the crib again. I don't see anything, just feel it. I had enough of this shit. I got up, picked up my daughter, and put her to sleep in the middle of us. Whatever that no-face giggling thing was, I was over it. Unless you have some lot of numbers, don't keep waking me up with no face. After speaking to a few elders, I was told it was just a friendly spirit, nothing evil. That's why it was allowed to enter even after being blessed. It just wanted to play and changed its form. That's why it had no face. My daughter has been showing signs of being sensitive as well, which I'll save for another day. I used to suffer from sleep paralysis a lot. It's always been terrifying, but there's just two instances where what happened was just completely out of normal. The first time I was maybe 15, I was going through a phase where I started to believe in God and was learning about him and reading the Bible. Sleep paralysis usually happens in the middle of the night, but this happened in the early morning. It was like my head was dragged to the curtains by itself. And I could clearly see two red eyes. When I had sleep paralysis, you could hear anything in particular. Maybe a resemblance of shouts, but nothing clear. This time was different. With a really unsettling voice, the eyes were telling me to do it. They told me to do it over and over and over. I couldn't snap out of it for a really long time. I couldn't even talk back to it inside my mind or anything. When it was over, I was really skeptical about what had happened. Part of me didn't believe it was real, and the other part was trying to make sense out of it and couldn't understand what was it. I had no idea what the thing wanted me to do. I kept it for myself for a time, but later told my grandma and asked her what she thought this thing wanted me to do. She advised me to not even try to learn what it wanted and just pray. I had thought maybe I was a bit biased since I was reading the Bible for the first time, and maybe my mind made a demon for me. But the truth is, the devil is not very demonic in the Bible. Yes, he is mean beyond normal standards, but he's never described in any way, and when you read what he says, he just sounds like a regular man making people or God question themselves. And the red eyes didn't mention anything about religion. And I didn't look at it that way. Still, maybe it had something to do with if it was real. The second time I saw them was 10 times more terrifying. I was working for a friend looking after her country house while her family was away. I was having a really hard time. The place was just enormous and had no way of stopping people from jumping the small grids. Some places you could stick through without even jumping and her family was rather wealthy, having a lot of valuables inside the house. From the house to the nearest entrance must have been like a kilometer. And there I learned woods are not like in the movies. Take five steps away from the light the house gives you and it's pitch black. You won't see one meter in front of you and it was as if flashlights got their lights sucked out of them. Using them would only give you three more meters in one direction. I was in the process of buying a gun when my friend forbid it. I don't live in the USA where people are okay with guns. She didn't like the idea of me killing someone who was just planning to steal a couple of oranges out of fear. I asked for a crossbow and she told me there wouldn't be any weapons in her house if I wanted to keep the job. I used to sleep in her TV room because I would play the PS4 there until I fell asleep, always with a knife below my pillow. One day I heard steps on the floor below and to my bad luck I had sleep paralysis as soon as they woke me up. I could hear these cautious steps going up the stairs, cracking without being able to move. Later they got to my couch. I had my face covered with the blanket. I was trying to reach for my knife, but I just couldn't move. Later, I swear for my life that the guy gently put the cover out of my face. I could stare at him at that point. It was really dark, and I couldn't see past his hoodie. He had the cap on. After like two seconds and the adrenaline just rushing, I snapped out with a hit, but the guy just banished. It was as if it was just made of shadow out of smoke. 
I swear I could see the smoke for two or three seconds before it disappeared towards one of the two paintings upstairs. I told this to my friend and asked her if the paintings had some story behind them. She kind of laughed it off and told me they were old but that a friar and some fruit had nothing to do with people made out of smoke wearing clothes from the 21st century. That was like five years ago. I haven't had a similar experience since then and I truly hope I just don't. I don't believe in this kind of stuff. I don't know if I convinced myself over the years or if it happened so long ago, it just doesn't feel real anymore. Still, I like in a weird way that I could live something almost taken out of a horror movie, real or not. What I perceived almost made me shit myself two times. This event happened when I was around 8 to 10 years old, in the garden of the house I used to live in. I'm telling this story as I remember it, without fabricating anything whatsoever. One day, I was playing in my garden. I liked to play with the ball I had or look through the chain link fence, which separated our family's property from a river. Now to explain the situation which occurred, I need to explain the shed we had in the garden. Now this shed was placed directly at the back of the garden, in the middle of the chain link fence. This meant I could enter the shed from the front, go to the right side of the shed or the left, but not the back, as it was placed in front of the fence. Another important note is that the right wall of the shed had a window that would grant you vision of the inside of the entire shed. One of the things I really enjoyed doing was walking over to the right side of the shed knocking the window three times, ducking down, then getting up and looking directly at the window. I remember doing this because it was fun for little me, but of course, nothing would ever show itself, and I only did this as a way of to role play. This day was very different. Although parts of my memory are hazy, I remember the main events with perfect detail. I was watching the river through the fence when I walked to the right side of the shed. I knocked on the window three times and ducked down. When I jumped back up and looked through the window, a pale white humanoid figure sprouted up and looked at me. I remember it looked at me in the eyes, then it opened its mouth and started moving it. It wasn't moving in a way as if it was talking, but it was just moving its lower jaw really fast. It's hard to describe. It was just moving its mouth really quick and I felt maliciousness coming from this creature. After that, it just ducked back down just as quickly as it had come. The situation must have been five seconds long, and I remember just staring at the window, dumbfounded, completely shocked at what I saw. Even though remembering this situation now makes me really creeped out and scared, eight to ten year old me was more curious and perplexed than scared, so I did what any curious child would have done, and entered the shed. After all, there was only one way in and out, which was the front door. The only window of the shed could not be opened anyway, so that thing should have been inside. When I walked to the shed, I saw nothing. The shed itself was really small, so there would have been nowhere to hide. I just remember being confused more than anything, so I closed the door and continued playing outside. Looking back at the situation as an adult, I would have absolutely ran away as the thing was only human shaped but definitely not from our world. Also, I get scared easily as well. This situation only happened once to me and never again, even though I played the window knocking ritual dozens of times after the event occurred. I wouldn't be surprised if it's an overactive imagination and I'm definitely open to that idea. The only problem was that the creature felt so real and I can't imagine young me conjuring such a creepy thing from my mind. I also thought that maybe it was my reflection being slightly distorted as it rose up at a similar time I did. Only problem with that theory is that the creature ducked down while I was still standing up. When I was about 15 years old, I got a phone call in the middle of the night that still sticks with me to this day. 
It was around 3 a.m. on a school night when I woke up to a phone call. I was wondering who the hell would be calling me this late, but it was from an unknown number. I answered the phone, and there was a lot of wind on the other end, like the person was running. They were screaming my name over and over again. They were terrified, like they were being chased or something. My parents had divorced, and at the time, my mum was working three jobs, including one at a casino. My first thought was someone was attacking her while she was walking out to her car. I screamed, Mom! Mom! But the only thing I heard was this person just screaming my name. And then the call dropped. At this point, I'm in tears, because I think my mom is getting brutally murdered. So I run upstairs to wake my dad up and tell him what's going on. He somehow manages to calm me down and tells me he'll call my mom's sister. The next day at school, I go to everyone I know, asking if they prank called me last night. No one admitted to it, and honestly, no one even seemed suspicious. I had a feeling something more sinister was going on, since the person on the other end was literally screaming at the top of their lungs. When I get home, my dad tells me that he got a hold of my aunt and that my mom was alright. I still couldn't figure out what had happened. Another weird thing about it was the call felt like it only lasted a few minutes, but the call log said it lasted a little over 10 minutes. That night, I'm getting ready for bed, and my dad pokes his head in my room to tell me that my great-grandma passed away last night, right around the same time I got the phone call. I never met my great-grandma before, but apparently she wasn't a very nice woman. Some family members would describe her as straight-up nasty, I honestly think I got a call from my great-grandma after she died, as she was being dragged to the afterlife. I used to live with two other roommates in my previous apartments. I'm a master, one dude in medium, and another in small room. So the medium room dude says, Hey fellas, I'm going out for dinner with my girl. See you later. We're like, alright dude, catch you later. Me and the small room guy had no plans, so we decided to have dinner together. So we're having some Indian food while watching Netflix in the living room. I remember we were watching Helsing. All's good. We had dinner, washed our hands, had some cookies and settled in on the couch watching a good TV show and enjoying a Saturday night in. Then all of a sudden, both of us noticed that a shadowy figure just popped its head out of the medium room. The entrance of all rooms is visible from the living room, but not like directly. They're at the far left, so you can catch with your eye if anyone is passing through or not. And of course, be able to hear them. So then it's not just me, but my roommate too. He says, hey, who's there? I'm like, did you see that? He's like, yeah. Didn't the middle room guy leave for dinner? Did he come back? I'm like, we've been sitting here watching TV. How could he go past us through the door without us seeing or hearing him? There's only one entrance to the apartment and that's also visible from the living room. It's a small place. The whole living and dining room is like 20 footsteps long in total from end to end. And at the end, there's the main door. So we're both perplexed. So we get up and start checking the whole house. Go into the medium guy's room. We're all bros, so nobody locks rooms or anything unless they're fucking inside. So no one is in the medium room. We check the bathroom, the small room, master room, kitchen. No one is any fucking where in the entire apartment. Just the two of us. So then we thought maybe we saw a shadow of something move. But that's impossible because we tried to recreate it and failed. Because there's no light source directly in front of the room doors. Nothing was flapping or fluttering or moving in any way anywhere. And a shadow moving across the walls is very different than a 3D shadow figure, popping its head out of the room to take a peek and getting back in. And it wasn't just me who saw it. Else I could just think of it as something I imagined. We weren't drinking, and we didn't take any drugs. Since then, sometimes I still notice something looking at me from the corner of my eyes. I catch something moving in my peripheral vision sometimes, and when I look, it's gone. And the only reason I notice is because I'm alone in my new place. And something was moving. And if it was just a shadow in the wall, well, they don't disappear when you look at them. I don't know what to think of this. I'm not scared of anything except stupid people. 
I'm just puzzled. Confusion is a confusing feeling for me because I don't believe in anything paranormal. There's always a scientific and logical reason for things. This one, I just don't know or couldn't have figured out yet. There are times where I'll be driving along and suddenly change my route, only to find the exact time I'd be going through a specific intersection, there'd be a crash, often deadly. This has happened so many times I've lost count. I was attending a New Year's Eve party with a large group of people, approximately 10 years ago, pre-COVID, when some drunk jock I didn't know showed up and instigated adult activities so he could listen and watch, which irked everyone. So they all chased him out. They then worried that he'd kill someone. He was that drunk. So I mediated for a moment. Turned to my closest friend at the time and told him straight faced, don't worry, it's all taken care of. Only to get a call from dude's girlfriend, blaming us for dude's arrest at the end of the driveway for drunk driving. I woke up before my alarm for almost three hours on 9-11. Had a sense of dread. Knew it was going to be a bad day and couldn't shake the feeling. I arrived at school seconds after the first tower was attacked and watched the second tower get hit live. I knew the day my grandmother was going to pass away. Three days beforehand and was desperately trying to get to the nursing home she was in. I visited daily for one final visit to say goodbye before she passed. I knew the moment she passed. Approximately 15 minutes prior to the notifi notification phone call. I inexplicably knew we'd end up with our favourite Cheeto in chief the second he announced that he was running for president. And that these last four years would be rife with death, destruction and a depressing repeat of history. My insomnia kicks up before nearly every major disaster. This past Sunday, 31st of May 2020, was no different. I took my older son to get an early birthday present, a new rib for his bicycle. It was close to 4.15pm, but I had the same dread from 9-11 wash over me, and was dying to get out of the area. We finally left just before our mayor initiated an emergency curfew for our downtown area because of the riots. I averaged maybe three hours of sleep a night for two days prior, feeling the dread creeping up. Tonight, as I type this, the dread is only getting worse instead of better. I'm not sure what fresh hell will greet us over the next few days, but it's only getting worse. Anyone else out there have this problem too? I can only sense horrible things to come, and it's incredibly frustrating. Hide and seek. An innocent enough game, right? Maybe in some houses, but not my childhood home. My brother and I are about a year and 25 days apart, age-wise. Absolutely hated each other. And found that we enjoyed tormenting each other. A lot of this had to do with the family dynamic, which in all honesty belongs in a different post. But I'm here to tell you about a terrifying experience I had when I was young. Not complain about my family. Even though my brother's relevance is minorly outlined here. A lot of strange things happened in the first house I remember. My brother and I were always told that we had hyperactive imaginations and that's what had us seeing things and hearing voices that weren't there. Things consistently got worse over time and our sleep began to suffer. After one of my more restless nights, my brother and I decided a game of hide and seek. The house was built in 1901 and we had a lot of stuff. My grandmother was what would be classified as a hoarder today. I was incredibly clever and used my small stature to my advantage, often to scarce the daylight out of my younger brother. I always had my hiding spots planned out three turns in advance and had settled on hiding in one of the best places I knew, one of the two closets in my bedroom. My brother's bedroom didn't have a closet, so I had to share one of my closets with him. I chose my closet to hide it. My closet was relatively easy to open at all times. It often wouldn't latch properly and would swing open in the middle of the night, usually scaring the bejesus out of me each time it happened. Using this to my advantage, 
I had most of my stuffed animals in the bottom of the closet. I situated myself in such a way that I could see the door when it opened, so that I could jump out and scare my brother. Just as I finally settled, I heard this strange growl above my head, in the pitch dark. Confused, because none of our dogs were in the closet with me, I looked up and I froze. Staring down at me was a severed wolf's head, lips curled back in a menacing snarl. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. Then it spoke to me. Get out or die. Bewildered at the sight, I dashed for the doorknob and attempted to open the door, but it was stuck. I could hear it still talking, but I was too determined to get out of the closet to hear what it was saying. When it finally finished speaking to me, the door swung wide open and I fell out onto the floor, crying my eyes out. I quickly rolled over to see if it was coming at me, but it was gone. It was the last time I ever played hide and seek in that house. So I'll start this story out with a bit of background. My older brother died in a pretty bad car accident about three years ago. I got a call from my dad early that morning, telling me that my older brother was in the hospital and things weren't looking good. So I went to the hospital and my first reaction was nausea and shock to see my older brother hooked up to machines, in a coma, and looking so small and lifeless. As the day went on, my shock hadn't entirely worn off, but I started to feel so angry. Angry that this has happened, and angry that he was in this position. The car accident was his fault. He had been drinking, and he was driving too fast, and he lost control of the car. I was mad at him for what he'd done. He passed away a couple of days ago, and I was devastated, still angry and confused at a crying mess. So then fast forward to maybe six-ish months later. My whole family is reeling from the loss of my brother, and my aunt and two uncles decide to have a psychic over. At first it was kind of a joke, none of them believed in anything supernatural, but my aunt told me that she finally had the courage to ask about my brother, and the psychic said he wanted to say that he was doing okay. I didn't get all the details since I wasn't there. Then the psychic says that my brother asks, is she still mad at me? I've never expressed my feelings of anger with anyone else in my family, because it made me feel terrible. I love my brother, and I was scared of feeling that way. Anyway, my aunts and uncles ask who my brother is talking about, and the psychic apparently looked puzzled for a minute and says, I'm not sure. I can only see fireworks. This is major, because my birthday is July 4th, Independence Day in the US, which fireworks are a staple for. I have no idea what to think about this whole thing. I still think about it all the time. I'm no longer angry at my brother and I've tried to express that to him, but I'm not even a believer in the supernatural, so I don't exactly know how. I hope that he knows that I'm not mad anymore and I love and miss him so much. It was Boston, the dead of night, after Christmas Day of 84, and I just turned four. It was a good year for presents, and one thing I got was a tent bed. A pop-up tent that fit over my mattress. I slept on one side of the house, while my parents and three sisters slept on the other, separated by the kitchen and living room. I woke up in the middle of the night to a noise coming from the living room. It sounded like random digital tones, like the first ten seconds of ELO's telephone line. I was clutching my Cabbage Patch Kid doll, and rolled over. I could see out of the vents at the top of the tent bed a cascade of tiny, shiny diamond shapes. They were floating down around my tent bed, not through the vent, and it didn't scare me or anything. I just thought, hey, look at that. Pretty interesting. Don't see that every day. Still carrying my cabbage patch doll, I unzipped the tent bed and walked to my door because I assumed my sister was going to get an ass whooping because she was up playing with one of the new toys. Specifically, a Monkey C Radio Shack calculator she got that made noises. When I got to the threshold I saw, standing in the kitchen about five feet in front of me, was a three foot tall humanoid blue creature, looking like it was made of modelling clay. 
It was holding my mum's ancient copy of The Joy of Cooking, open and reading it, and then looked directly at me, and its mouth went round like an O. I assumed in surprise. I immediately noped the fuck out and jumped back into my tent bed, clutching the cabbage patch doll lightly. I was completely terrified and just stayed like that until I eventually fell asleep. Nothing like that happened before or since, and I remember it like yesterday. I was very close to my nanny, who was barely five feet tall and big on hugging and patting her loved ones. I was living overseas, 1993, when she was diagnosed with a return of breast cancer. I flew back to see her a month or so after her diagnosis. Took her to radiation treatments, manicured her nails, watched her stories, soap operas, every day. And after a wonderful visit, which ended with hugs and pats with her little arthritic hands and many I love yous, I flew home, sure she was going to beat it. Then, that phone call saying the treatments hadn't worked and she couldn't survive. I couldn't afford to fly home again so soon, and Nanny passed the message that she didn't want me to see her so sick. Then... The dreaded call when she died. I was devastated, totally shattered. The day of her funeral, feeling a million miles from my loved ones, I got in the shower thinking about Nanny and started to cry. I knew nobody could hear me in the shower, so I really let go and sobbed. I was standing facing the water with my back exposed in the rear. And in the middle of my grief, I felt a small warm hand patting me about shoulder blade height. I whipped around, embarrassed to have been caught howling with grief. But there was nobody there. We had glass shower doors and I could see that nobody was in the bathroom. I know in my heart that my precious little nanny was comforting me. She knew how much I loved her and the hole her death left in my heart. But she didn't want me to grieve like that. And she was letting me know she was still with me, although I couldn't see her. I've never seen or felt anything else since she died, but I could still remember the comfort of her little hand when I needed it most. When I was 11, 1974, we moved into a house built about 1990. It was built on the site of an early house, and this was in rural Virginia, near Civil War battlefields. Our house had been vacated by an old man who had lived there for 50 years, and his wife had died in the house years before. He left a lot of family junk behind, trunks full of clothes and letters written during World War II, old furniture. I loved exploring the house and digging through all the old belongings. My parents were slowly cleaning it all out and remodeling. One day, I went up to the attic to look through some trunks. I looked through some old photos and letters then opened a trunk that had a collapsed hoop skirt and some old long dresses. While I was digging through the trunk, I heard someone coming up the attic stairs. I was sure it was my little sister following me. I was kneeling next to the trunk and looking towards the stairs, when I saw the head and shoulders of a young woman I didn't know coming up. She was looking down at her feet and walking normally up the stairs, making climbing noises. As she came up, I noticed she had on a long blue dress and was holding the front of it up as she climbed the stairs. I could see ankle high boots with short heels. When she got to the top of the stairs, my eyes were bugging out at this point, I could see all of her. She was wearing a Civil War era dress with a hoop skirt and her dark brown hair was in a snud at the back. She stopped to smooth down her dress and then took a step towards the pile of trunks and junk. I could clearly see her face and clothing. She looked like a real human, not see-through or ghosty. At that point, she saw me crouching by the trunks and looked startled. Then she disappeared, and I never saw or heard her again. I was shocked, but not afraid. I kept that hoop skirt and played with it for months, until it disintegrated with age. Later, my mother told me her own spooky story from the house. My dad had gone to work and my sister and I were at school. She decided to vacuum the downstairs, so she turned on the vacuum and got started. She became aware of the sound of breathing and ignored it. The breathing got louder and louder until she couldn't ignore it. 
So she turned off the vacuum and listened. Scared, of course. It occurred to her it might be the old man's wife who died, looking for him. So she explained where Mr. X had gone to live. She explained that we love the house and we're going to fix it up and take good care of it. After she explained, the breathing slowly faded, quieter and quieter until it ended. Mom never heard or saw anything else unexplained in that house, but she's convinced that Mrs. X had come to visit her husband and couldn't find him. So she contacted Mom by breathing to get her attention. We lived in New England years ago, in a newer house with the bedrooms upstairs. Our kids were small at the time, so I had a baby monitor set up next to my bed, for the youngest kid's room. In the middle of the night, I woke up hearing the distant sounds of several children talking and laughing, sort of like the noises you'd hear on a playground. I sat up and put my ear closer to the baby monitor, thinking maybe our son woke up and was playing in his crib, but the sounds weren't coming from there. I lowered the volume all the way and could still hear children playing. It wasn't coming from the direction of the kids' room, but from the master bathroom on by the end of my house. I got up and walked towards the bathroom, puzzled and listening. The voices got louder as I approached, childish shrieks, the chanting of a game and laughter. All my hair was standing up, and I gathered my courage to take that final step around the corner into the bathroom. The second I stepped into the doorway, silence. Nothing was there, no noise at all. I checked the kids' rooms and all of them were sound asleep. Hubby never woke up during any of this. I went downstairs and looked around, checking that doors were locked. I laid awake for a long time after I got back to bed, not really scared, but definitely puzzled. I asked an an older neighbour what was on our property before our house was built, thinking maybe there had been an old school or a house with kids. He said it was a dairy farmland as far back as he could remember. 70 years. I never heard the children playing again, but I could hear it in my head as clearly as the night it happened. The first incident, which happened before Godzilla, was when I was very young. I shared a room with my sister. I was startled awake, but didn't know why. I looked over at my sister, who was sound asleep, and immediately realised what woke me up. Something was scratching at my window, but not normal scratching. It was almost like when someone is keying a car. The scratching ran along my windows as if someone was walking with a key against it. Problem is, my windows were high up, and it would take a seven foot tall person to do it. I was shocked it didn't wake my sister. I remember being so scared that I couldn't move. The keying of the windows proceeded down to each window of each room of the house and incredibly, I could hear it the whole time. My brother's room, he didn't wake up. The bathrooms, living room, etc. It finally ended at my parents' room. There finally, I heard my mother mutter something to my dad. Couldn't understand what she said, but they went back to sleep immediately. Surprisingly, I fell back to sleep also and never mentioned it again. So many little things happened before I became an adult. My sister and I spotted something strange in the sky in broad daylight and no one else noticed. A giant doll of mine ended up in weird places as if she walked. My cat is always sensing movement at the same time as me out of the corner of my eye. So many things. Half are just a blur with time. But as I grew up, and they kept happening, my adult memories of newer incidents are far sharper in my brain. Not much happened in my teen or early adult years. I was so busy with school, marriage and building a life that I forgot about it. Until one day, a reminder of my past experiences. We just bought a house. My husband and I were fighting about it, if he shouldn't play golf the next day or not. I didn't want him to, but he wasn't having it. We laid down in our tiny house to go to sleep and all of a sudden, we heard this loud crash. We ran out to the living room and what did we see? 
His golf clubs were strewn everywhere. It looked like someone had picked them up and threw them across the room. Guess someone or something was on my side of the argument. I let him play anyway. One night my husband and I were woken by a popping sound and something falling on the floor. Lots of somethings, in fact. We ran towards the noise and noticed in the kitchen that the plastic cups drying in the rack were popping out of their holding position and falling on the floor. Right before our eyes. Not dishes, not silverware or anything else. Just cups. And it didn't stop until the last one fell. A few weeks, maybe a month later, I was awoken by my two pugs barking. I figured there was an animal outside nearby, so I got up. Hubby was still asleep. I noticed the direction they were barking and again it was my kitchen. This time the loaf of bread that was sitting on the counter was floating a few inches above. Then it dropped to the ground and was hard enough to damage it. Now all of these things, including the golf clubs, might not be that exciting, but the incidents always followed an argument about said objects with my husband. You already know the backstory of the golf clubs, but the cups argument was my husband telling me, before we went to bed, that we should put the dishes away. I asked him why and what could really happen to them if we waited till morning. The bread, I yelled at him to put it back in the fridge and he forgot. Was something trying to put a wedge between us? I don't know. I'm sure a few things that I can't remember happen in the next year or so, but the next incident that sticks in my mind was when I was around eight months pregnant with my firstborn. My husband wasn't home, and it was around 9 or 10 p.m. I was watching TV with my dogs in my recliner. My male dog would never leave my side when I was pregnant. All of a sudden, the male starts growling at the room where the nursery is set up. It's dark in there. He keeps growling, and now my female starts barking. I start getting a weird feeling in my stomach. A deep, weird feeling in the pit of it. Then, the baby started moving more than usual. This went on for a bit, and I was so scared that I just sat there and stared at that room. As quick as it all started, it was even quicker when it stopped. I called my husband and asked him to come home. He did because he could tell by my voice that something else happened. The rest of my pregnancy was uneventful. The day comes when we bring my son home. No problems until about two months in. I start to notice a pattern with my son and him waking up at exactly 3.23am every night. He had a baby monitor in his room and I would wake to his giggles and laughter. Now you're probably thinking that's so much better than waking up to screaming and crying, but it wasn't. You see, I start to realise that the giggling and laughter sounds familiar. It sounds just like when someone he knows is peeking over his crib and making him laugh. Once I realise this, I start running to the room, and as soon as I turn on his light and run to his crib, I notice him laughing and looking in another direction than where I'm standing. He kept laughing and cooing in that direction until I startled him with my voice. Then he looks at me and smiles or cries, depending on what he wants. This went on for a while, even when I started leaving his light on. I even tried having him sleep with us, but he just wasn't comfortable with that. I guess, I figured, he liked whoever was visiting him and meant him no harm. It slowed down and stopped completely once he was in his first big boy bed. Once he started talking, he was able to tell me if anything was happening. I'd find him in his room with his toys laughing and smiling at the window. I asked him why he was laughing, and he would point to the window and say the man was funny. What man, I asked. The man in the window. It was scary enough that he possibly saw a man in the window, but what was scarier is that it was the second floor of my house. There's no way a man could be up there. This happened often, but again, he seemed happy with the man in the window. Until I had my daughter. Unfortunately, it was a different situation for my daughter. Once she started sleeping in the nursery, she started waking up at the same time every night. 3.23am. But she wouldn't laugh. She would cry. With this, I put her back in our room for another year until she was ready for her own bed. Once that happened, it was uneventful for a year or so. One night when I was in the kitchen cooking, hubby wasn't home yet. 
I heard my daughter crying and saying, go away. I ran in and asked her what was wrong. All she could do was point to the window, but her brother, who was in there too, said that the man was back and he didn't like my daughter. Well, from then on, I told my daughter to play in the living room near me so the man would leave her alone. A few years went by. A few things happened, but not bad. We ended up selling that house and moving into a bigger one. All was well with the kids. Nothing else happened to them, and they're adults now. Although I do notice that my son has a lot of interest in paranormal stuff. But it seemed, whatever it was, was not done with me. From about 2001 on, every time someone close to me died, I would get a visit from them within a week after their death. Sometimes they'd say something, and sometimes not. It was always right before I fell asleep. My dad was one of them. A few days after he died, he visited me. He looked into my bedroom and smiled. I asked how he was feeling because he was in so much pain before he died. He simply waved his hands down his body and gave me thumbs up, which I took as he was feeling good. Others visited and I was honest with my whole family and told them when it happened. Friends, pets and my mother-in-law, she kept turning the whole light on, which would she do when she was alive? Did the same. But my mom didn't. About two months later, my sister and I were cleaning out my mom's house. She asked if my mom visited me after dying. I said no and told her that it bothered me. Was she mad? Did I do something? My sister told me that she probably just wasn't ready to contact me. Well, I got home later that night and mom felt it was time. My husband and I were watching TV and we started listening to music, like from a music box. It was coming from my china cabinet. I walked over and realized that my very old music box that my mother had given to me when I was a child was playing music. What's strange is that it hadn't worked for many, many years. I cherished that music box because it was a gift from my mom. She knew I loved it and I really believed that was her way of saying goodbye to me. The visitations still happen, but not often. I still see movement out of the side of my eye, but it's slowed down along with all other paranormal activity. Around a week ago, I had a dream. And since it's been a week already, I cannot recall the exact events, but what I can unearth is vivid. It was set in a very different place, a place that looks dystopian. And I was running away from what seems to be a governing entity of the area a group of men, just like how FBI agents chase fugitives, that kind of vibe. I was running with a girl. We climbed on top of several overhead railings, parkour style, until we perched on a high ledge overlooking a pair of railroad tracks. At that point, I can feel the overwhelming dread. The girl looked at me and said, the only way to get out of here is to jump when the train comes. I nodded and just a few moments later, a huge train came roaring our way. I jumped, but was shocked to realize I jumped prematurely and I was about to get hit by the train. I just closed my eyes as the train's front lights blinded me and then puff, I woke up gasping for air. I went out of my room and sat on a chair, trying to make sense of that dream. The last events were too real, not to mention the timing for it to be a dream. I'm not sure if I was supposed to die so we can get out of here, like the girl said. Or we were supposed to get on top of the train to get away, but we failed. But then again, I have no way of knowing. I don't remember seeing the girl jump either. Fast forward to today, October 25th, 3 p.m. in the Philippines, or 3 a.m. Eastern time. I was walking out of my room greatly bothered because I had a redo of that same dream, but with a different scenario. Same dystopian setting. I know it's the same because I saw the exact street island and the same group of men running toward me and the fear of being caught feeling was taking over. To make the long story short, I got caught, but the people who caught me were surprisingly gentle. Didn't torture me or anything like that. They just contained me and led me into a huge room with lots of bunker beds. I was imprisoned along with other people who don't look like criminals at all. Most of them are girls, and the men were very gentle too, and that brought me a feeling of security. 
almost like it made me happy at that moment. Everyone was wearing a uniform with a light shade of brown. A warden came in and announced, we have a new member, please introduce yourself. I mentioned my name and I joked a little bit and ended with me rapping to another inmate's beatboxing. Everyone was having a good time. Then lights out, I pretended to be asleep because I was planning to escape and look for the girl in the past dream so I can get answers. I was excited for that because I might prove something here. As I was fake sleeping, waiting for the right hour, someone or something stood beside my bed and stabbed me in the chest and puff, I woke up gasping for air. I walked out of my room and I saw my mom watching a video of the three o'clock prayer. I looked at the clock and it was exactly 3 p.m. I need thoughts on this. The timing and the reason for me snapping out of both dreams was being killed. Felt real for the first time and now it happened again. I'm convinced it's not a dream. I also have hopes of knowing if someone out there had a similar dream, hence me stating the date and time. So this happened when I was in eighth or ninth grade. My friend and her family had gone on vacation and she had enlisted me to come over daily and feed and check on her cats. The first couple of days, my mom came with me. Then the third day, my mom went by herself. I was babysitting all day. Then the fourth day, I went by myself. The house was three blocks away, so I walked. Now I had been in the house probably a hundred times at this point, so I had no reason to be timid or scared. And at first I wasn't. I went in, went around the corner to the kitchen, and switched out the water and gave the cat some fresh food. Then I came back into the living room and snuggled the nice kitty. I say that because their older cat was seriously one of the meanest cats I've ever known. Hated everyone. So I was totally fine with her hiding and not wanting attention. I was about to leave, but then remembered that my friend said I could borrow some books from her room. We were both bookworms. So I went down the narrow hallway to her room real quick and started looking through her bookshelf. This put my back to the doorway. I'd been browsing for a few minutes when very suddenly, I felt cold and terrified. I was sure someone was standing in the doorway behind me. It took me several moments, but I finally summoned the courage to turn around. As I looked at the doorway, it was as though someone was just started out of sight. At this point, I decided to screw the books and noped the hell out of there. I ran out of the room back down the narrow hallway, into the living room and to the front door. The whole time it felt like someone was behind me. I didn't even turn around until I was outside and then just to lock the door and then ran home. I didn't say anything to my mom for a few weeks, but I did make excuses for her to go with me every day after that until my friend returned. A couple of weeks later, I decided to bring it up to my mom when we were driving somewhere. I thought it could be something to laugh about, like, ha, huh, I freaked out for no reason, silly me. But my mom just got really quiet, turned down the car radio and said, honey, the same thing happened to me the day before when I went alone. I didn't say anything to you because I didn't want you to be scared going over there. And I thought it was just my imagination playing tricks on me. Needless to say, my blood ran cold and the experience has stuck with me all these years. Things that might be relevant, the house was built in the early 50s. My friend at the time was into Ouija boards and the like, but never took it seriously. I also found out years later that her mom was emotionally abusing her. So has anyone else experienced anything like this and have theories as to what happened? So I want to preface this by saying this happened a few years ago, with only me and my now ex being the only ones that have witnessed it. I mainly want to put my little encounter out there to see if anyone else has similar stories. And I do remember looking this up a while back, but with no answers. Here's my story. So this happened on a usual weekday. It was night time, around 10 or 11, on a summer night. It gets pretty muggy at night in my part of the world, so I like to keep the windows open at night when it's cooler outside. And this was one of those nights. Me and the girlfriend were getting ready to go to bed as usual for her at this time. 
but I'd cuddle her till she sleeps so I can get up and fuck around the house like a cat at 3am. As we're in bed, it's pitch black. She likes it dark and quiet. I'm sure fuck don't. And the only light is the street light from outside my window. About only 20 minutes of this. I was kind of in that state where you're dozing off, but not quite about to knock out anytime soon. I also want to clarify that I have sleep problems and have had the occasional sleep paralysis and hypnagogic imagery since I was 12. So around this time is when I hear these faint noises that sounded like it's coming from outside. The best way I can explain it is like human vo vocals singing, making a he noise and then a ha noise. The he noise sounded higher pitched and like a woman, while the ha noise was quite deep and sounded like a man. At first, I chalked it up to my brain, making me hear things because of the stage of sleep that I was in. But me being paranoid, I went into caution mode. I opened my eyes and lifted my head up to look towards the window when I was still laying down. The girlfriend noticed this and asked, what's wrong? I then responded with, did you hear that? And she said back, hear what? Immediately after she said that, we heard the noise again, but ever so slightly with more volume. The same pitch, but sounded closer than before. That's when we both sat up on the bed, me almost leaping the fuck out in fear. We were both frozen there for a few good seconds, looking at each other with that, the fuck was that, face. Only about ten seconds after this, the noise came back. Same perfect pitch and length. But let me tell you when I say it was louder. This time it sounded like whatever made the sound was right outside the window. I went into panic mode and jumped out the bed to turn the lights on, while the girlfriend was still in bed because apparently she wasn't shooketh like I was. We both went, yo, what the fuck was that? Is that a person? And just stood frozen for a bit. The sound was back yet again after another 10 seconds, as if it was clockwork, but now fainter than before. This is when I decided now's a good chance to peep out the window to see what kind of alien Slenderman multidimensional creature is making the noise. But there's nothing outside. After doing this, I didn't hear it again, and I was afraid it's because whatever it was spotted me and just stopped doing it after that. The girlfriend was sort of just chuckling in disbelief while I was about to poop myself. It took me a while afterwards to feel comfortable enough to keep my window open, let alone sleep without the TV on. But that was the only and one time this has ever happened to me. We hadn't had an experience in a couple of months. I thought that maybe it moved on finally. That's not the case. I've been feeling super uneasy and unsafe in my house, especially at night. I guess for good reason. Two nights ago, I heard a young girl screaming from my parents' bedroom. I stood there, trying to figure out what to do. I was home alone. Soon after, music started playing. I thought maybe it was my phone, but it wasn't. I never found the source of the music. My parents soon arrived home, and I left the bathroom. I had locked myself in there. Probably about five nights ago, I had a dream about a demonic young boy. He was like dimmed grey and black. Even his skin was grey and black. He was wearing old worn out clothes and had bright glowing yellow eyes. I saw him walking up the stairs towards me in my dream. The lights flickered around us. I screamed at him in the name of Jesus to leave me alone and he did. He disappeared into thin air. I woke up around five totally petrified from the dream because it felt so real. I checked my phone to see it was around five. I felt like I was being watched, so I just sat there for a bit. I had no idea what was going on outside of my room. In the living room, my sister and mother were sleeping. My sister explained to me that she woke up and felt something grabbing her ankles and was terrified. She had her blanket covering her face mostly, so she couldn't see everything, but she said she did have a hole in the blanket where she saw exactly what was grabbing her. She said she saw a little girl with long black hair, a deformed rotting face and a white dress, no eyes. She said she closed her eyes because she was too afraid to look at it anymore. Then she woke up again. 
She said she never remembered going back to sleep, but she woke up again and she knew that she was awake the other time, so she was confused. She then saw the little girl for the second time standing in the living room. Then the little girl ran into the kitchen, back and forth and back and forth, before she disappeared. My sister checked the time she woke up for the second time, around five o'clock. Was this a coincidence? Both waking up at five o'clock? Could be, but I feel like it wasn't. My sister said that sometimes the ottoman in the living room where her feet are shakes violently sometimes and that it wasn't the first time the little girl was grabbing her feet. A few months ago, she had sleep paralysis and that was the first time she saw the little girl. She needs a new place to sleep. Obviously, the living room isn't working for her. She had a dream where a bright red light shined from the living room and when she tried to enter, an angel threw her back and told her, do not enter the living room. Not at night. She woke up with the feeling of something watching her. Although I'm worried about her, I'm slightly glad that it's so violent with her and not me. Because it was the other way around a little bit ago. I had all this terrifying stuff and she was getting dreams. Now I'm getting dreams and she's having terrifying stuff happen to her. It switched. Maybe it decided after five years I needed a break. She's not as strong as I am though. She doesn't know what she's dealing with or how to combat it, really. I grew up learning about paranormal and dealing with experience after experience, but she never did. She just didn't want to know. After she was attacked at the asylum we went to, I feel like maybe things know she's an easy target now. This happened a couple of days ago. My family and I went to an old asylum while on vacation. They had renovated it up a bit and put a couple of stores and a restaurant inside, so my father thought it would be a nice place to visit. Ha! <laughs> when we first drove into the driveway, I was overcome with dizziness. I couldn't see straight, and I could finish typing the message I had been typing before we pulled in. As I got out of the car, the dizziness subsided for the most part, and we all went inside. It still looked like an asylum. The doors were like metal cage doors. The floor was old and cracked. The walls were old yellowed bricks and there were entrances that were covered over with more bricks so no one could enter. As we began walking down the halls, I noticed something was off. The overall feeling in the place was just terrible. I started getting a headache, but it was only minor. I know spirits can give people headaches and stomach aches, so I wasn't surprised. As I said, mine was minor, but I couldn't help but notice that my sister was getting worse and worse. As we continued walking down the hall, we stopped to look at one of the stores. There was an old looking metal door that resembled something that would be on an animal cage. It was just a pitch black empty room on the other side. I had mentioned to my mother the feeling I had about the place. And so as a joke, she held me close to the cage and said, look in there, do you see a ghost yet? As they were all laughing, I stood there in shock, for there was someone on the other side of the gate looking back at me. I ripped away from her grasp and kept walking down the hall, away from the cage-like door. My sister was giving me a look, so I knew she wanted to tell me something. We went off the side, and she told me she had a terrible pounding headache. We kept walking, and she told me about it, but I could see she was getting worse like she didn't know where she was going anymore. I took her outside the building for a minute to help her head and told her to pray and imagine a white light around herself. And she did this and started to walk away from the building. Her headache was getting better. My father scheduled for us to eat inside the building and our table was ready, so we were forced to go back inside. She told me her headache was even worse than before and that she was about to pass out and that the praying and white light now made it worse. We were texting each other and she was telling me that she felt a strong pressure on her back and head. Soon enough, I could see she couldn't take it anymore, so I took her outside again. My parents were furious, but only because they didn't understand. Once I took her outside, she started to cry and shake and so I took her away from the building and we went on a walk. We went across the street and I talked to her about how the Lord was with her. Her headache stopped and so did the pressure. Our parents texted us 
telling us that the food was there, so we again were forced to enter the building. I held her hands and prayed with her before we entered again. We ate as fast as possible and got out even before our parents did. We drove off, but she still felt uneasy, and so did I. We got out of the car at our next destination, but it was almost like we were still in the asylum. My sister started crying and shaking again. She asked me if it could make her kill herself. I asked her why, and she told me that it was giving her suicidal thoughts, and that it was making her depressed and draining her energy. I took her and my mom and dad, and we all prayed together over her. As I placed my hand on her head while praying, it was weird. I could feel it there still. It had followed us there. I thought she would be an easy target. And maybe she would have been if I wasn't there. Maybe that's what scares me the most. I'm not sure if it's gone or not, but when we arrived back at the hotel, I saw and heard someone following me in the hall. So I thought it was my sister, but when I turned around, no one was there. But that could have just been a different spirit. I'm pretty used to them now. Last night, my sister and I didn't sleep. We were kept awake all night. Maybe we were scared, or maybe we were kept up by something else. Something dark. Something inhuman. I guess we'll know soon enough, won't we? It was morning. Maybe 10.30 or something like that. It was very bright outside, but not like a lot of sun, like a nice summer day. Kind of cloudy. Made the house look dark. We were late for an appointment, so my mother went out to drive the car up to the door so we could get in and go. We have a rather long driveway. So it was just my sister and I inside the house. She ran to my parents' bathroom to fix her hair, and I stayed in the bathroom off the kitchen. I hadn't had many paranormal experiences for at least a week, and so I was just randomly singing, and then for no reason at all, I just started making up lyrics that weren't in the song. Like, haven't seen you in a while, are you actually real? Yeah, you are, but maybe you should leave. Then I continued and said, go back to hell. After I said it, I knew that was a bad thing to say. Well, I was proven right. Seconds after I felt a breath on my neck, then someone blowing in my ear, not softly. I turned back and no one was there, but there were two loud knocks on the door. I turned and before I had said anything, thinking it was my sister telling me it was time to go, a woman's raspy voice said, no, as if it was saying it wouldn't go back to hell. I opened the door and no one was there. I shut the door and continued to brush my hair. Then I opened the door and I saw my sister come around the corner. You ready to go, she said. Then Jay asked her, did you knock on the door out there? She looked at me like, are you serious? No, we don't have time for this. We have to go. I agreed and we went out the door. Later that night, I was in the same bathroom and my dad and sister were picking out a movie to watch. We have like 10,000 movies, so it took them a long time. I heard a knock on the door and I said, hold on, I'm almost out. But then I was curious, so I opened the door anyway and no one was there. So I closed it and finished and then walked into the living room. Did you guys knock on the door? I asked. No, we're trying to find a movie, they replied. You were here the whole time? Yes, they clarified. Okay, so it wasn't them, but maybe it was my mom. She knocks on the bathroom door to annoy me sometimes, but she always fesses up if, I, if it was her. I walked to her bedroom and she was on her bed sleeping. Huh? I said to myself. Well, guess I had another one, as in a paranormal experience. I walked upstairs to take a shower and I started to get undressed. By now, I was wearing only my underclothes. I'd heard something knock on the bathroom door upstairs, which was the bathroom I was in currently. I went to open the door because it likely would have been my sister, but I stopped before I touched the handle. If it were her, I would have heard her come up the stairs and open the door. I didn't hear anyone walking on the stairs, and the door to the stairs didn't open. We have a door downstairs, and when you open it, there's stairs that go upstairs. Our house is old, so the stairs and the door both make a lot of noise. 
The house was built in the 1880s and just added on to over the years. Then I thought it was her, the raspy woman. I left the door closed. I said to myself, wait, you're so stupid. It was just your cat. Your cat knocks up on the door all the time. Then I stood there thinking about it and went to text my friend. Then I heard someone jumping. On the top step and then on the second to top step, back and forth like they were jumping between the steps for fun. Then I heard something run up to the door. I looked to the bottom and there was a small shadow of where they were. They ran down the hall and up the hall. Of course, I thought nothing of this because my cat does this all the time. Then it ran back up the door. Then back down the hall really fast and into my sister's room. It's just the cat, I said to myself. I turned around and basically shattered my pants. I had forgotten the sink was on because my cha- cat was drinking from the faucet. And so my cat was in the bathroom with me. But it's watching the door like it heard the same things I did. And I looked at it and went, shit. I called my sister and I could hear the TV in the background, which also meant it wasn't her. I said, come upstairs. She complained about it at first, but eventually complied. Then I took my shower. I didn't tell her what happened because she knows the house is haunted, but doesn't like me to tell her about what happens to me because it scares her. She's never had experiences to the extent that I have except once. One time when she was home alone, she heard a woman screaming. She heard it twice, and then she hid in a corner until we got home. Same thing happened to me about a week later. I only heard it once, but the memory will never leave me. It was one of the scariest nights of my life. So she's asked me not to share my stories with her, so I have to share them here. The first one I have is from two months ago. I was in my room around 2.30 and the only lights I had on were my fairy lights. I had a feeling I wasn't alone, but I couldn't hear anything. Feeling that it was nice, so I just sat in fear. Then I heard a woman breathing and then she said, psst, and I just ignored it and sat there until I could feel she left the room. Two days after I went into the other part of the barn for fun, The barn has a part of the animals and a part for work and machinery. I went into the machinery part. I started hearing a conversation coming from the second floor, so I called out, then they stopped. Then I heard a huge crash and footsteps going towards the old ladder to get up there. I ran fast. The next time was a week after. I was sleeping on the other side of the house with my sister. We were both up for most of the night. And so this happened, it just turned 3am. Ironically, I started crawling behind the couch where I was supposed to be sleeping, around 2.57. But it picked up at 3 o'clock. I had a terrible feeling. After 5 minutes, the crawling stopped, but then I heard this ungodly growl. I asked my sister if she heard that too. She was in a sectioned part of the room across from where I was, so she couldn't see me. She said she heard it too. Then the feeling got more intense and I got up to run to her sectioned room thing. When I stood up, I saw a tall, black, bony figure standing hunched over by the door to the outside. I ran to her room and closed the door, but it was still there in the room with us. We called our parents and they finally made it to the other side of the house. But by the time they came out, it was already gone. Three weeks later, I went into the barn again and my friend wanted a tour. She was on FaceTime. I started getting that feeling again, and just as I was going to leave, I heard a dog barking from the next room. I knew very well there wasn't a dog, and whatever it was, was attempting to lure me over there. So I left. My mother had experiences like this when she was younger, but never like the ones I've had. I have a hard time believing that all four houses we've lived in have been haunted. I don't even think it's the houses anymore. I think it's me. They can't sense the spirits usually, and they can't sense if they're good or evil like I can. I see them everywhere I go. Even if the house isn't haunted, they pay me a visit. It's like I attract them to me. 
I used to think that my house had a portal, but it's just me, isn't it? When I was first born, my parents put me in the nursery, and the nursery became haunted. My brother had terrible nightmares there, if he ever tried to sleep in there. But only after I was born did it become my room. It started with her a few days ago. I was in my room in one of the oldest rooms in this old 1880s house. It was about 2am and I felt this sinking drop. The one I get when someone's there. I froze and waited. Then I clearly heard psst. My heart began to race as I sat there in absolute fear. I couldn't move. Eventually, the sinking feeling subsided and I was left alone in the dark with my fear. She left the room, but she was still there. That was the first encounter. After that, I would have to go feed the animals in the barn every morning. I was hearing footsteps above me on the second floor. There's this hole in the ceiling, above where the cat's food is. I heard someone get on the floor next to the two by two hole. I looked over and saw a piece of hair hanging down. I froze and watched as it was pulled back up to the second floor. I ran so fast out of there, it wasn't even funny. I had to go feed the animals by walking through the pasture and going in from the back. After that, I started staying up later. I just couldn't sleep. I felt like something was watching me every night. This was two days ago. I was starting to fall asleep. It was only around 12.40, so it wasn't that late. I was almost asleep when I started hearing this children's music from my room. Then, I saw the lady pulling me closer and closer until she was right in my face, and I got snapped back to reality. It freaked me out, but I blew it off. I tried falling asleep again. The children's music started, and she pulled me closer and closer, until she was in my face, and I snapped back to reality, again. I tried one more time and the same exact thing happened. I felt my stomach drop. She was behind my door. I was so terrified. I picked up my stuff and ran as fast as I could and went to another room downstairs to try and sleep in. I finally fell asleep around 2.30. I'm not quite sure what she wants with me and I'm not so sure I want to find out. All I know is that she's here. Always around. Just waiting. The experience started five months after we moved in. We moved in four or so years ago. The first time I thought something might be up is when my sister called my mother and I was terrified. We were on our way home from my orchestra practice. She called and you could tell she was shaking but she wouldn't tell us what happened. She just said, just please hurry, please come home fast. We drove home to find her sitting in a corner of the living room. We asked her what happened and she said she'd been watching her TV show on her phone and then she heard some girl scream like a teenager scream. She said she thought it was part of her TV show because she was watching Glee. So then she paused her show and a couple seconds later she heard it again. A teenage girl screaming bloody murder. I had a hard time imagining that that could actually happen but I totally believed her. Because before this house, we've lived in two other haunted house, so not new to the paranormal. After that, my mom prayed through the kitchen, living room and fam family room. That only made it worse. About a week later, my sister was at basketball practice. I was home alone. I was walking through the kitchen when all of a sudden I stopped. Not even four feet away from me behind a corner, I heard her screaming. But it wasn't a teenager. It was a woman, like early 30s. I froze. I didn't know what to do. So I backed away slowly and hid in the stairwell upstairs. You see, in the dining room, there's a door. And when you open it, it stares to the upstairs. So I sat on the third step and called my friend like five times. But she didn't pick up, so I called my mom. I could barely talk. I just told her she needed to get home as fast as possible. I sat there for 15 minutes until she got home. 
I didn't even close the door because I didn't want to leave my dog. So I was terrified of the demon, but I wasn't going to abandon my dog, so I watched him. That was three years ago, but I can still hear her screaming. About a month later, I was rearranging my room. I was turning, but as I was turning, I saw this little girl in the mirror that looked me, but her eyes and mouth were blacked out. I said that it was just because I was turning. I didn't realise till later when I was thinking about her blonde hair and blue shirt that I wasn't wearing a blue shirt. After I saw her, I turned to see a woman. She was there for a second, but then gone. She looked like she was burned. I knew it was just trying to scare me. She had black tufts of black hair coming out of her head, with skin hanging off her face because she was so badly burned. Bright green eyes and a long white dress. I kept walking. It didn't scare me much. I went downstairs, and that's when I realised that the little girl in the mirror wasn't me. The next day, I was walking my dog. We have this big 1880s dairy barn, so I thought I would explore it with my dog. It was sunny and cool. It was a nice morning for it. I opened the barn door and went in. Dust and old tools were everywhere. I proceeded to walk in further. There was one room that was pitch black. I peeked in and there was nothing but a table. Next to this room was a big heavy door with a lock. I fidgeted with the lock until it opened. I swung open the big door and it stuck. I guess the hinges were rusty. I went in with my dog and he sniffed around while I explored. There was an old beaten up refrigerator and a bathroom with cobwebs in the toilet a lot with wood, dirt and rocks. Same as the sink and the windows were broken. Looked like someone threw rocks through the panes for fun. I went and stood next to a big beam in the middle of the room with my dog. And I went on my phone to check my text messages. I didn't have many because I was 11 at the time. I put my phone away and I started to walk towards the door. And it was closed. Huh? I thought I left it open, I said to myself. And I did. It stuck because of the hinges. I pushed and pushed, but it wouldn't open. Just then, I heard big, heavy footsteps on the second floor. I looked up and so did my dog. His hair on his back stood up and he started growling and barking. I told him to shut up and I moved to the back of the room with him. The heavy construction boots followed me wherever I went. There was a small door towards the back of the room and I pulled the white string and it opened. So me and my dog went into the next room. It was a small rock room with a hole in the wall that looked into the pitch black room on the other side of the door. I could crawl through there with my dog to escape, I thought, but I dismissed that idea quickly because no, just no. There was a better option. A door to the outside pasture in the room. I went to the door and turned the handle, but it wouldn't budge. It was jammed. The footsteps were getting closer and there was a hole in the ceiling, so I needed to get out quickly. I ran and kicked the door as hard as I could and it flew open. I ran outside with my dog and didn't even bother to close the door. I looked up at the barn and one of the panels fell sideways. Then I saw a black figure run across it. I know what you're thinking. It was an animal is all, but that's not the case. The second floor of the barn is rotted out. If there was an animal up there or a person, they would fall right through. I went around the barn until, until I saw the barn door that I entered through. I was feeling brave, so I went back in to see why the door wouldn't open. It was locked. The padlock was locked. I then ran out of my haunted barn with my dog and went back inside my haunted house. Over time, it got more frequent. I would see shadows, people dressed in old-timey outfits. I even got a couple of Polaroid pictures of them. In one, you can see a woman screaming and starting to disappear. And in the other, you can see a little ball of white light with two black dots for eyes. In the last one, I can't say for sure it's paranormal, but it's weird. A room with 13 windows in the middle of a hot summer day. I took a picture of my dog and it's pitch black. I can only see the outline of his body and his glowing red eyes and big mouth and sharp teeth. Next to him is a thick line of orange mist. Again, 13 windows, hot summer day. It was very light there. 
My mom told me later that she kept checking on us at night because she heard a teenage girl screaming and she thought it was us. But when she got up there, we were never awake. Always happens around two or three in the morning. It was about a year and a half in which I decided to tell my mom everything that I had seen. And when I did, I regretted it. We were sitting on the couch in the living room and I told her everything I had seen. And I started crying because there was a lot of emotion and I don't know why, but I felt pain and hatred. It was like I was feeling what they felt. She told me that it was okay and that she would pray and I said, no, don't you make it worse like last time? She said, how would praying make it worse? I replied, I don't know and I don't want to find out. She went into the office where I heard the woman screaming and all of a sudden I got this really bad feeling. She knelt down to pray and I told her that she shouldn't do that there. She didn't listen. And she started to pray and I felt the woman's presence in that corner. I knew that she was here and she was mad. My mom's eyes popped open. She looked at me concerned, but she kept praying. I started crying silently and walked over to her when she was finished. I told her she shouldn't have done that and that the woman was mad at her. She said that she didn't feel right and that she thinks I'm right and something didn't like that because the hairs on the back of her neck stood up. We went back over to the couch and I saw in the reflection of the window, the burned lady. That's what I call her. Ever since I saw her in my bedroom, that's what I call her. I saw her standing 10 feet away by the TV. I told my mom. Then two minutes later, I saw her standing in the reflection again, but she was much closer. She was four feet away. I then told my mom again, and then she told me she was tired and that she needed to go to bed. So I turned off the light, and as I turned, I saw a woman in her early 30s, maybe, in a navy blue old timeish dress staring at me. Her brown hair was in a bun and she was holding her hands. Then she disappeared. I didn't tell my brother about that one. I saw the same woman looking out of the window of my sister's room upstairs a few months ago. I called her Fiona because of the dream I had. Recently, in the last five months, sometimes terrifying things happened. I was sleeping in my room upstairs and I heard a woman talking in my room. I was starting to wake up and then I was fully conscious. I was awake, but I couldn't open my eyes until she finished talking. I don't know why. Before I was conscious, I don't know what she said, but once I was, I heard the last couple things she said. Go to hell. Then she said something in a different language. Copper Darnum. My eyes shot open and I sat up quickly. I felt her presence in the room with me. She was still there. I searched up Copper Darnum but got no results in any language. So I think it was demon language, an ancient extinct language. I texted my mom and called her. She was awake already. She said she had a bad dream. I called her and told her what happened and I told her that it was standing in front of my keyboard staring at me and that I needed to come downstairs. My mom was sleeping in the living room as she often does because my dad snores so loud. I climbed out of bed and jogged out of my room and down the stairs. I can't explain to you how I can see something that didn't reveal itself to me. I just could. I think most humans can. I slept the rest of the night downstairs and that was that. Later that morning, I was looking for a movie to watch and I was home alone except for my mom. I heard a man's voice in my kitchen. It didn't say much. All it said was, huh? But it echoed through the whole house. I called my mom, but it was too scared to speak. So she got irritated and hung up. I then heard the medicine fall to the floor there. I stood up and looked behind the corner. Nothing. No one was there, but the medicine was across the kitchen. It had been thrown. I walked through the kitchen because I didn't feel him there anymore. And I told my mom what happened and she was in her bed trying to sleep. So she wasn't happy that I bothered her. Later that night, she came into the kitchen and said, why is my medicine on the floor? She was sick at the time. So it was like some cold medicine of some kind. I told her the man threw it. So I didn't want to move it because obviously he wanted it on the floor. She rolled her eyes and picked it up and took some and went back to her room. 
This next one happened three months ago. I was talking well, singing in the bathroom and making up words to the song. And I for some reason said that I wished all the demons here would leave and that it wasn't their house. I knew it was a mistake once it came out of my mouth. Not even five seconds later, I felt someone in the room with me and then someone was blowing in my ear to get me to look at the door. Once I did, there were two door shaking knocks. Then a raspy woman's voice said, no. It wasn't a quick no, but like, no. I opened the door as fast as I could, but there was no one there. My sister then came out from my parents' room, so she was like 20 feet away and she said, come on, we've got to go, we're going to be late. I grabbed the keys and we left for our appointment. And I told them what happened and they laughed. Then we all laughed. We're at the point where we've had so many experiences that it's funny. Not so much scares us anymore. Two weeks after that, my mother and I went into the barn with tweezers and the barn cat had a tick. So she put the tweezers on the hay table and went to catch the cat. Once we caught her, I told her to hand me the tweezers. She stood up and searched and searched and she couldn't find them. They weren't there. She picked up the bale and looked underneath it and on top of it and behind it. They weren't there. We looked for the tweezers for 10 minutes straight and now she was mad. I said, the ghost probably took them. You should ask for them back. But I said that as a joke. She then shouted, please give me back my tweezers. A couple minutes later, she went to sit back down and there they were, on top of the table. We looked at each other and both said in unison, thank you. But when she picked them up, they were bent, so we couldn't use them anyway. Literally bent. We just went back inside and got a new set of tweezers and removed the tick later that day. When I play my piano, I'll get the scent of a woman's perfume next to me for a couple minutes, then it's gone. Like she's coming to listen to me and play. And that doesn't bother me. It was the last time when I smelled rotten flesh behind me. I didn't dare look because I was too afraid. But then it started tapping in my chair and I could feel it. It was crawling under my chair. I jumped up and left because nope, nope, nope. I still see shadows from time to time and the people still listen to me play the piano. As long as it's the woman, it's okay. Because I know that she really enjoys it. Last thing, I play very complicated piano pieces that are scary and sad at the same time. You might think this is not weird, but I don't play the piano and I can't read the music. And the music that I play is never ever happy. When I was younger, around four to six, we lived in my grandparents' house while we searched for an apartment. I can't pin this exactly on the paranormal, but I think it was because what are the odds? My sister and I shared a room and every night I woke up from 3.11 to 3.17 with a dead laybug smashed under my neck. I remember it because it was every single night for the whole like three years I'd lived there. And every night there would be walking up and down the hallway. It would walk into each room like it was checking to make sure everything was okay. It was just plain odd. Now, I was super young, so I didn't think anything of it. But as I got older, I realised that wasn't normal. Now, you might think that's not bad and really after everything I've been through, it's not. But these next stories are much worse. After we moved out, we would visit occasionally and I would play the piano at her house. Now my mother used to see a woman there in the house when she was a child and I believe that I can feel that same woman there with me. This only happens when I'm alone but it doesn't change how scary it is. I'll play the piano, about 5-10 to ten minutes in I'll hear a shuffle upstairs, then slow heavy steps coming down the stairs, one by one, until she steps to the bottom of the stairs. She comes up behind me but then I feel like she's harmful, it's weird. I know this sounds crazy, but it's like a game. The faster I play, the faster she comes down the stairs and I have to turn around when she gets too close, so she goes back further. One day, I was at her house alone and I was playing the piano. I could feel the woman near, so I said aloud, hello, missus. 
I then started to play. One minute later, I felt this really scary feeling come over me and I stopped playing. As I did, I heard the woman whisper in my ear, Hi. I turned and no one was there. Then as I went to turn back towards the piano, I saw her face in the reflection of the window behind me. That's when I knew it was really bad. I ran to the kitchen, which was like 10 steps away. Then I stopped and I looked back to where I saw her and I said to myself, don't run, don't show your fear. That's what it wants. So I sat down at the table. I started to play this little psychic game, like a matching game or whatever. And I felt this feeling again, this overwhelming fear. Then my heel started to tingle. Over the span of 15 seconds, I could feel this intense pressure on my heel, like someone squishing it. And then I said aloud, stop. Then the pressure stopped. Then it bit me. I screamed and turned and remembered to not show fear. So I said, I guess I'll just see you guys later. Bye. And I ran out of there really quick. I looked down at my heel, but there were no marks or signs of being bitten, but it still hurts. I know what it was. It was a pair of human teeth. So now when I play the piano, I make sure that she stays far, far away. Not today, Satan. I've only lived in three houses my entire life. All three were haunted. I was starting to think it was a coincidence, but maybe she's just following me wherever I go. The experiences differ like different kind of ghosts, but I can't help but think it's her. I'll be telling you today about the second house I lived in. It was an apartment in a pretty big apartment complex with lots of land. There was this trail that after walking past the apartments and storage places, you could see a path. After following the path on both sides, you have a cornfield and a forest. We used to play there in the summer. My sister and I would run around in the cornfield away from my father and he would try to find us. It's a perfectly normal game. I remember one time though, I was running through the corn and I stopped. I thought I heard breathing. So I started to move slowly the other way and then stopped to see if I could hear it again. I didn't hear the breathing, but I saw the corn moving. And I could hear it too. I naturally thought it was my father, so I ran. I kept doing this for 10 minutes straight until I ran out of the cornfield and heard my dad shouting from the opposite direction of where I thought he was. I went over there and my sister was with him. Where were you? He asked. He was irritated. Apparently, he'd been yelling at me. But I didn't hear a thing. I told him I had forgotten my shoes. I'm in the cornfield but he wouldn't let me go back. I guess it didn't hit me until later that whatever was chasing me around in that cornfield wasn't my dad or my sister. I was completely alone. This next one happened pretty much every night after I had my own room. I was about seven at the time when this started. I had just gotten my own room and I was happy about it, but not at night. There was this closet in my room. It was super creepy and always scared me, but I never used it. It was hard for me to fall asleep, but I did it eventually. It was the morning that was scary. I woke up and all my stuffed animals that I had on top of me were on the other side of the couch, were on the ground. But in a perfect circle around my bed. I instantly thought it was my mother that did it. My mother never played pranks on us because she grew up in a haunted house and didn't want to scare us. And if she did do it, she would have confessed. I then went to go ask my dad, but he was asleep. I peeked in my sister's room and she was asleep too. So I waited for them to wake up. They both denied. The next night, the same thing happened. I woke up to the stuffed animals all staring at me, a perfect circle around my bed. Same thing I asked. Who did it? No one confessed. After a week of that happening, I begged them to tell me if it was them, but I knew it wasn't. No one confessed. This continued for six years until we moved out every morning. In that house, there were some scary things. I knew that there was someone else there, even at my young age. I would sleepwalk and I don't do that now. 
it stopped once we moved. I used to walk down the stairs and sleep on the couch in the pitch black living room at night. I even talked to my mom when this happened sometimes. Usually she'd ask if I was okay and I would tell her that I was just fine. But I don't remember any of that. I just remember waking up on the couch. Just to preface, I've had many encounters throughout my life, especially as a child. I've not had any experiences for over four years, until three days ago. There have been many issues in my family, severely affecting me. My younger siblings and my dad, which is causing a lot of strife and pain. I recently rented a room at my cousin's place. A few days after moving in, I woke up, and maybe it was a dream, to a person standing in the corner saying they were sorry. I keep the door locked as there's a person living in the room across the hallway. I don't usually remember my dreams. I thought to myself that I would like a nightmare every so often in order to feel something that wasn't sadness or indifference in my life. This particular night, I would wake up for a second, adjust myself and go back to sleep. This happened four times. The last time, I saw a masculine figure in the dark. It had an unnerving grin and began to whisper a certain word, which I do not remember, with a slight lisp. I remember waking up soon after with a strange feeling and a slight tinge of fear. I sleep with my television at the foot of my bed to watch movies and play video games while laying down. The head of my bed is to the left of a window. There was a little light so that I could not see my reflection on the TV screen. The donut was black except for where the window was, which was white. I stared into my black TV screen for a few seconds, thinking about what occurred when I saw a roundish shape, shadow like a head when the light was. I stared at the shadow thinking it was my head. I had just woken up and it was taken aback by my dream, so I wasn't all there. I guess whatever that shadow belonged to noticed I was staring at its reflection and just vanished. That's when I froze. The round shape wasn't there anymore, so I stuck out my arm as far as it went until it showed up on my screen. That's when I confirmed that it truly wasn't my shadow. I instantly had the urge to take a huge dump, which happens whenever I'm super nervous or afraid, and I ran out of the room to use the restroom and stayed fixed on the toilet for an hour, trying to take everything in. This has never happened to me before, I've seen solid apparitions before, and have even seen objects moved seemingly by themselves. The timing that's interesting is it must have been solid since it had a shadow. I also live on the second floor, and the backyard is fenced off. Has anyone had similar experiences? What could it have been? While I was in this trance state, it was like my third eye actually opened and my vision went from black static to space. A dark round planet, I think, with a misty red aura stretching from the sides. The space was vast and filled with stars and what I think may have been a star forming, I'm not really sure what it was. This didn't last long before I went back to normal. And the feeling while I was there was what I can only think to be love in its most purest form. I also felt excited, of course. I never got body tingles during the meditation, so the visual change was unexpected. Unless I only get visual change when my body is in a state of high vibration. I did get tingles after the meditation, though. I tried telling my significant other about it, but they've written it off as being my imagination. And of course, that is plausible. But even my imagination isn't capable of the feeling that I had felt within this state. I've never felt anything like it before. All my fears and worries were gone, like I could do anything. I felt nothing but an enormous amount of love. It felt like I was at home. All I've been able to think about is how badly I want to go back. I'm going to try again tonight. I hope I'm able to contact some sort of physical being. I still felt like I contacted something, but nothing in the realm of physicality, or at least not that I could make out. Also, just so everyone is aware, I've never done psychedelics or gotten high for meditation. 
I do this so others as well as myself can't use that as an excuse to discredit my experiences. I've always been sober and completely conscious during these experiences. Since I've been eight years old, I've experienced the same dream, more times than I can count. I'm running through a tall forest of flowers, while something cruel and malevolent pursues me. Then I make it to this big, old Victorian built house. I always go inside the house, passing a kitchen and a bathroom with a rose-coloured tub. Once inside, I go up a set of stairs and into a bedroom on the right. Inside the bedroom in the closet, there's a stair that leads to the attic. I go up the stairs and into the attic. I go through the attic and there's a small hidden door that takes me behind a false wall where there's a little hallway hidden from view. This hallway ends in a room. Okay, you might wonder what it is. We all have dreams. What makes this different is this house exists. The bathroom, the stairway, the hidden hallway and the room exist exactly as I described. But I've never been there. How did I discover it existed then? Good question. Two years ago, my dad was at my farm helping my husband and I with some renovations. We got to talking one night and I asked him how his recent trip to Ontario had gone. Good, he replied, except our rental car was broken into and all our ID, cash and documents were stolen. That's awful, I answered. What did you do? He said, sadly, our family wasn't much help and no one really opened their homes up. However, he had these friends since he was a kid. Twins, whose family lived on the plots adjoining their home. Their family home was empty, but they kept it for when they wanted to travel as a second home. He said his friends had opened their home to him and my stepmother and saved the trip. Honestly, that would have been the end of it, till he said, everything was like I remembered it, right down to the secret room. I don't know why, my blood stopped moving. My whole body froze up. Secret room? I forced out. Dad, don't tell me anything more. I've been having a recurring dream since I was little. Let me tell you what I've seen. Then, you tell me if I'm right. So I walked him through the house, the hidden hallway into the room. I even described the pillows on the floor in detail. He was white and pretty shook up as I gave minute detail on a place I had only ever seen while asleep. The strange thing is that often in my dreams, I was not me. I mean, I was, but I was also someone else. Like, I remember a girl sometimes being in the secret room with me and the other boys. In the dream, I have a crush on her, although I'm a girl. In the dreams, I think I may have been my dad, if that makes any sense. Also, the evil malevolence that would cause me to run to the house and the secret room where I felt safe. My grandfather was a very, very bad man. The kind that lines up his kids and shot at their feet when he was drunk. The kind of man that did unspeakable things to his own daughters and would drive his wife and kids down deserted roads, take their shoes and make them walk barefoot back home in the snow in the middle of winter. The tall flowers in my dream. My dad said there was an empty plot between his house and his two best friends. His dad had rented it out to his friend's family and they had filled it with sunflowers. For the record, my dad rarely talks about his past. I've never been to his house in real life, and we live in Alberta, over 3,000 kilometres away from where he grew up. I'm not young, and I've never seen a photo of his friends or their home. Since the revelation, I've not had the dream again. I kind of miss it. My secret room that was only mine in dreams. My dad did ask his friends if I could go and see the house if I made it down to Sturgeon Falls, Ontario. I would love to see it for real. I'll start off by saying I've experienced a lot of paranormal events of many different kinds throughout my life. I'll also say that I've watched Stephen King's Firestarter and in fact loved the book and movie. If someone to sh were to share the experience I'm about to share with you, I'd probably laugh and say they're just living a Stephen King fantasy. 
so you may or may not believe me. I'll understand if you don't, but I wonder if anyone else has had experience with this. This took place in 1997, my last year of high school. I was dating a boy named Jeffrey, and we'd been dating for a few years. The weekend, we went to a dance for our local Gymkhana. It's like a rodeo group. I was still fairly new to the group, and didn't know a lot of people. Midway into the dance, Jeffrey said he was going to leave to drive a girl we went to school with home. I asked him to hurry, as I was shy, didn't know many people, and felt awkward there alone. Time ticked by, a half hour, an hour, two hours, and Jeff didn't return. He had been my ride, so I decided to walk to the nearest payphone and call my mom to come get me. Now this entire time, my anger had been growing steadily, so I was pretty much fuming and ready to boil over. In fact, my hands were clenched in fists as I walked out after being ditched by my boyfriend. I should also add that I had recently started being suspicious of him and the girl he had driven home. However, I had no proof of anything was going on until that moment. So I walked outside and who did I see sitting in his truck idling in the parking lot but Jeffrey? I was so angry and I don't know why I said the word burn. It was honestly probably because of the Stephen King book Firestarter but what I felt was an instant rush of all the pent up anger leaving me all at once. Also, in that same moment, or a second or two later, flames shot out of the hood of Jeffrey's truck. He jumped out, took off his jacket, and smothered the flames. I have to tell you, as angry as I was before, all the anger was gone, and I went trotting over. I asked him what he thought had happened, and he said he wasn't sure. Maybe a fuse had lit on fire. I was all smiles, and I told him what I had experienced, and what I thought had happened. That might seem weird, but I had literally no anger left at all. In fact, I felt great. He looked really concerned and said that he thought I, I might be a witch. I was definitely am not. Anyway, because I never share this, I don't know if there are other people out there with a similar experience. I did have a thought, though, about spontaneous combustion and how and why it might kill people. I pushed all the energy out with a directive. If someone were filled with that much anger and didn't push it out, I think it could possibly lead to spontaneous combustion. So the following happened around 2014 in the Appalachian Mountains of Pennsylvania. I was about 14 or 15 when I had this initial experience. And it left my mind until I began researching abductions and different paranormal entities. Everyone within my rural area lives in forests and hunts religiously. And I'm no exception to that rule. It was about October in archery buck season in Bedford, Pennsylvania. It was a normal evening of hunting at the base of the mountain in the swamps that my family owned. My dad wasn't near me at the time so he was on the opposite end waiting for a large buck that he'd been trying to ambush. I was sitting in my climber stand in a pine tree, packed area with two trails running underneath me. It was still fairly bright outside, with just a slight darkness to the area. Enough that you could see the haze of a flashlight, yet still clearly see ahead without it. I was facing the mountainside, so thick pine trees mostly covered the sky from my view. I heard leaves begin to crackle, and suddenly, roughly five or six deer run full speed past my stand, and back up the mountain. They came out of the pine saplings that lay in front of me, as if they came from nowhere. It was at that moment, a massive LED-looking light flashed and seemed to fill the sky in above me. It was a bluish light, and covered three to four treetops. As quickly as it flashed, it left, however... And when it left, everything turned dark. It was ridiculous to think that it turned dark that quickly, as I couldn't see the reflective sight of my bow at that point. It was as if the sun just went out as soon as it went over the distant mountains on my back. I sat there dumbfounded, pondering what had happened for about ten minutes, before my dad came by in his side-by-side -side on the road. 
I left the stand that night weirded out by it, but I didn't think anything weird until the next day. I woke up with a cold sore on my left eye, which isn't unusual to me, as it happens all the time due to sunlight or stress. I got dressed and went to school, but as the day went on, I began to get a bad headache. I made it to lunch when a lunch lady, who was a personal friend, looked at me bewildered. I hadn't noticed, but the right side of my head was swollen severely. It was sticking out a good half inch, almost giving me a lopsided appearance. She told me to go to the nurse's office, quickly. I went to the nurse's suite, and she promptly called my mom to take me to the doctor, as she thought I may have contracted shingles from a teacher who had an outbreak that month. We went to the doctor, and he looked at me and sent me home after explaining it was probably a poison of some kind while in the tree. I know my area, and there isn't poison oak locally, and I don't get affected by poison ivy though. After I got home, I forgot about the situation and moved on. My head got better, and I didn't give it much thought until the summer when I had my first sleep paralysis situation. After I had it, I began to look into different paranormal stuff again, and for the first time, I looked into abduction stories and Mothman sightings. The conjunctivitis and different after effects made me think back to my experience in the tree stand. The reasons I'm bringing this story up is because of the lost time that went by. The sudden flash and the deer appearing from nowhere without any prior sound. And the after effect of the experience which happened the day after. I don't remember seeing anything or having nightmares directly after the incident, but it makes me wonder what I saw that night. So I went for a walk at 4.30am, two nights ago. I live in a city area that's usually pretty empty at this time, which is part of why I usually like walking around like that. I'm not bothered by it most of the time, no matter what time I go out. I don't feel worried or scared. However, as soon as I hit the bottom of my street that morning, I was feeling very anxious. I didn't know if it was just general anxiety or some sort of gut feeling. So I kept walking. The feeling kept growing until I was terrified and yet I kept walking. It was late enough that some people were waking up and the birds were waking up too. But it, it did not quell my anxiety in the slightest. I remember smelling something dead when passing by some bushes in a neighbour's yard. And for some reason, I wanted to avoid all the tall dark hedges or forested areas to the point where I would walk in the street or on the opposite sidewalk. I had intended to go to 7-Eleven and get some coffee. By the time I was halfway there, I was so distraught that I just turned off and started heading home. It felt like something was following me or watching me, and I couldn't shake that feeling. I didn't feel any better until I was well within my neighbourhood, and as I was opening my front door, I turned for a split second thought I saw what seemed to be a very, very tall old man standing behind my next door neighbour's hedges. I'm not even sure I saw it correctly. As I said, it was just a second, but it made me jump as I opened the door. Since then, I felt discomfort at night, but I'm not sure if it's just anxiety from the experience or if it's something else. I've had a lot of paranormal experiences, but nothing has ever made me feel so terrified as that walk. I still don't know what it was, whether it was some kind of warning or something was in fact following me, but I don't plan on going out at night again, anytime soon. However, I was wondering if any of you might have an idea. I know it's not extremely detailed. Sometimes I attribute this to a very strange encounter I had when I was around four. I had just come out of the house with my baby sister. We lived in a condo area, six condos to each group, two above us and the same for the other side across from us, all connected with just some steps and stones underneath to separate the condos. But as kids, we'd play on the rocks. One morning, me and my sister walk outside and out of the rocks under the steps, a weird blue spider-esque thing arises. It just rose up, 
and I know it's a memory and not a dream, for a fact. One, my dreams don't capture reality so perfectly, and the physics of the rocks falling off it were too real. Not to mention, my sister remembers this as well. But it rose up. It was maybe four feet tall. No four legs. No discernible face. And was a striking blue colour. But it was weird, because it moved but didn't move at the same time. Almost like it vibrated into places. Like it came to the sidewalk but didn't move its legs. I know it was turning, but it wasn't moving. You could just tell. It had an oval-like head. My sister started to cry uncontrollably, but I wasn't scared. But for some reason, I acted scared. I don't know why. Also, it was broad daylight when this happened. I took her inside fast and shut and locked the door, and went on with daily life. I didn't think much of it. I never saw it again, nor did I mention it for years. I saw and went through a lot of things growing up, but never anything like that again. It didn't feel bad or malicious or anything. If anything, I couldn't get a read on it at all. But back to the spiders. Sometimes I think of that and wonder if that's why spiders love me so much. I remember being nine and having a daddy long legs run with me. It never stopped after that. Spiders frequently made beelines for me or mad dashes. They never bite me though. I also have a serious arachnophobia, so they rarely get on me and I don't want to go anywhere near them. A couple have made it on me, but they never bite or even move once they get on me. They just sit still. It's weird. It's a very strange experience. They'll run across ceilings and web down to get me. There was one time I woke up to one coming down diagonally to land on my head. I narrowly dodged it and it landed on my pillow, but I didn't even know they could move diagonally for some reason. I remember when we were moving out of one of our houses. I was sitting in the front yard and looked over to see a spider running through the grass toward me. I ran away and sat on the road instead, sitting at a rec centre parking lot waiting for my boyfriend. It was a spider that created the curb to come at me, and I fled from that one too. They're just all over the place, all the time. There have been two that have gotten on me while I was awake, and I'm 99% sure that they somehow materialised because my spidey senses are on point. One was a big spider, and my sister was just like, don't look, and smacked it off my shoulder. Another one was a little black spider. One time I passed out drunk in the woods with my fiancé. Classy, I know. But he walked back to find a lot of spiders on me. A variety too, some of which he had never seen just congregating around me and on me. That was pretty recent. I don't know what it is with me and spiders, and I don't know this is very long. There are many more times they've run towards me or people who don't believe me coming to believe me sincerely because of how spiders interact with me. I know people probably won't read all of this, or maybe won't even understand, but if someone has any ideas, please let me know, because this is the question I've wanted any kind of answer to for a long time. We ended up staying in a Marriott suite in New Hampshire for a two-month stay at the beginning stages of the COVID-19 pandemic. My wife, newborn and I, everything was going as normal. I'm heading to the elevator to go outside and have a smoke. Lobby semi-full, the bar is closed but you can buy your bottles and take them up. Now, I was all alone in my room expecting my wife, sister-in-law and my three nephews. I turned on my PS4 to run a little Rainbow Six when I heard children's voices laughing, giggling, and sounded like they're running from the elevator towards my end of the hallway. I get up from the chair and go to unlock the door. To my surprise, there's no one in the hallway. I walk towards the corner elevator and no one is on sight. I was like, what the fuck? Am I hearing things? Two days after, we're heading back to the hotel from an outing and the wife is downstairs chatting with front desk manager, which is a long-time friend of ours. I put my doggy bag in the microwave and started to hear a flock of kids running and laughing, 
giggling, chatting away. I look through the peephole and see no one in sight yet again. I call downstairs and ask the manager, Nisha, that I keep moment hearing kids running up and down the hallway. She said we're the only ones booked on the third floor and the third floor security and don't see anyone on the cameras either. I was like, well, I heard them right outside my door. Now this was going on just about every day to every other day. And like a clown, I open the door and still see no one. One night I'm all alone. My wife is out with the girls and this time, I swear I heard a kid's voice in my bathroom. And I go to check, no one in there. I'm watching TV. I think it was the Travel Channel and a paranormal show was on at the moment. And it was displaying a cigar company that had child labour going on in the 1800s. And at one point, there was a fire accident that burned the cigar warehouse down. And there was over 80 deaths. Many were women and children. And when they exposed the building and whereabouts, it was the very building where we were staying. It was bought out not too long ago of our stay and renovated by Marriott Suites. I immediately got goosebumps and looked at the door. I opened it up and stared down the hallways looking for signs. I even googled it up and found out that it was factual. Now, I wasn't scared, I was all excited. My wife was a different story. She was nervous and scared. I think we heard them and felt them more due to our child in the room. My wife, though, had me pack my things up, talking about, let's head back home. Last year, my now fiancé and I moved into my parents' house. My parents had built onto my grandparents' home when they got married, so I now live in what used to be my grandparents' home. This is just to clarify that we have our own undisturbed living area. I have a bathroom attached to my bedroom, which also attaches on the other side to my brother's old room. This night, my brother was home and asked if I wanted to go to the pub with him. I declined and went to bed around 10pm. My fiancé was working late, so I was alone in my room. Around 2am, I was woken by some banging and scratching on the wall in the bathroom. It sounded to me like somebody had a 2 by 4 piece of timber and was hitting it against the wall and then dragging it down. This happened repeatedly for a few minutes. I sat up in bed and listened for a while. I didn't feel frightened. To be honest, I thought that my brother had come home drunk and was just being bizarre. It struck me as odd because I could see the light was not on in the bathroom. After a few minutes, the light did come on and I heard my brother enter the bathroom. The noise immediately stopped. I didn't think too much more about it because I still thought it was him. Maybe fumbling around for the light switch or something. I went back to sleep and forgot about it. The next morning, when I was making coffee, my brother asked me the eerie question. Was that you making noise last night? A few weeks later, I heard the noise again, but again with no explanation. Finally, another few weeks later, I finished having a shower one morning and had just returned to my bedroom. I heard the noise again, directly on the other side of the door. I was pleased that I could finally discover the source, so I gleefully pulled open the door and... Nothing. There was nobody there and no apparent source of the noise, which, by the way, had stopped. I then looked up and remembered that the entrance to the attic is in that room. It happened in August 2019, while I was visiting my cousin and friends in Yokohama. I was 19 at that time. I was on my way back from my friend's apartment to my cousin's place where I was staying. It was close enough, so I decided to walk, despite it already being dark and late. I was close to Yokohama Harbour, walking on the pathway right next to the water. In the distance, I noticed a figure standing next to the railings, staring at the sea. There was nobody else around. I got a strange feeling from them, but I had to pass them. The figure didn't move when I got close. 
for some reason, I stopped to look at them when I was right behind. The person was wearing a black trench coat reaching past their knees and had their hands tucked in their pockets. While I was staring at them, they turned around to look at me. The street lamps provided a good light and I was standing close enough to make out their features. It was a girl, clearly foreign, and the first thing I noticed was how absolutely beautiful she was. Rather tall, maybe around 5'8", dressed in modern, entirely black clothes, with dark, wavy hair reaching her shoulders. She was young, couldn't be older than 18, maybe younger. My gaze lingered on her eyes and a chill went down my spine. They were light, but completely empty. It was like looking into a void. She stared at me. Her expression was blank. It didn't change since she turned to me, but I had a feeling she was waiting for me to do or say something. I tried, but I couldn't find words. I was frozen in place. We stared at each other for a while, until at one moment I blinked, and she disappeared. There was nowhere she could have gone. It just vanished into thin air. Scared, I hurried to my cousin's apartment. When he saw me, he pointed out that I looked white as a sheet. But hearing my story, he just laughed that I hallucinated a hot girl. I researched Japanese urban legends out of curiosity, but I couldn't find anything about a young girl wearing a trench coat. She didn't even look like a ghost. It was like looking at a normal human being. A few days later, while my cousin and I were on our way back to his apartment, something on the other side of the street caught my eye. I looked, and in the shadow of a black alley, Leaning against a wall was the same girl, still dressed in the black, wearing a coat. She was clearly looking at me. Her expression was the same as then. Blank. Maybe a little bored. I shook my cousin's shoulder and told him to look, but when he did, she was already gone. Just vanished again. For the rest of my stay, I had a feeling someone was watching me whenever I went outside, and sometimes I could see the black coat in the crowd. It could have just been my paranoia, but I was seriously afraid. When I came back home, the feeling stopped, and nothing weird happened again. The only time I've actually seen a ghost was when I was about 16. I'm 33 now, but I remember it clearly. I lived with my grandparents primarily and had my bedroom in the basement. They had lived in their wartime house since they got married, 55 years prior. They had eight kids and I hadn't heard a single ghost story from my grandparents or any of my aunts and uncles. Only my cousin, who used to feed a dog under the bed. But that's another story. As part of my weird high school routine, I used to wake up at 2 or 3 every morning, have a bowl of cereal and watch Pokemon. My internal clock would wake me up, and actually, it still does sometimes. One night when I woke up, I felt a presence nearby. I looked to my right, right by the doorway to my room. Even though my room was pitch black, I clearly saw the figure of a man. I thought for sure someone had broken in, and I was going to be raped or murdered, because this figure just didn't seem ghost-like. The figure was a young man, probably in his early 20s. He was overweight, had blonde hair and glasses, and was wearing a red t-shirt and jeans. He wasn't some ominous shadow or an old-timey renaissance ghost. He looked like a standard early 2000s guy. I had no idea who this person was and had never seen him before, but I remember him well to this day. I stared at him for what felt like 10 minutes, but was probably 10 seconds. I waited for him to make the first move. I guess towards murdering me, but I didn't get any evil vibes. Although I was super freaked out, this was not the image I'd conjure up when I'd think about ghosts. I finally turned my bedside lamp on, and when I did, he disappeared. At this point, I was wide awake, and couldn't stop obsessing over what just happened. Again, I was scared, but he seemed harmless enough that I didn't feel the need to wake up my grandparents. I read a few chapters of my Buffy the Vampire Slayer book before trying to fall asleep again.
This is a little bit difficult to talk about, as it happened last Thursday night and is still very emotional. A little backstory. I've always been in touch with the other side. They use me a lot. Typically, I have no emotional connection with any spirit I come in contact with. This was different. An important piece of information is that I have a six-year-old daughter. When I go outside, oftentimes she'll be directly on the other side of the front door and asking when I'll be back in. In the early afternoon, my wife and I had stepped outside for a few minutes. As usual, I heard a little girl on the other side of the door. Not so unusual, the little girl said mama. My daughter always calls me mommy or mom. I answered yes dear, just as I always would. But there was no response from the other side of the door. I realised that my daughter was playing in her room the whole time. Later that night, my wife and I were laying in bed scrolling Reddit, and my six-year-old had only just fallen asleep. I heard what sounded like the six-year-old getting out of bed. I waited for her to come out to our door, but she never showed up. I got up to check on her. She was still very much asleep. I crawled back into bed and after a few moments, I heard it again. We have cats, so hearing noises at night isn't out of the ordinary. I thought nothing of it. Whenever six-year-old is standing in my doorway, I can feel it. Awake or asleep, I feel it. Well, I had that same feeling after hearing the noise again. I turned around expecting to see my dark-haired, green-eyed daughter. Only the child I saw was so blonde, her hair was almost white, and her eyes were golden brown. I looked away for a split second at my wife, and the child was gone. About 30 seconds later, I heard that same voice say, Mama, just as a few hours earlier. My wife didn't see her nor hear her, but she very clearly heard it the first time. The age of this child is what mine would have been, had I not miscarried. The father is blonde with golden eyes. She had my curls and his chubby cheeks. I could just feel that she was my baby. She came to me because I needed something to keep me going. Okay, when I was a little girl, from really my youngest memories until I was probably around 12 years old, I heard voices. Not like someone with schizophrenia hears voices and may tell what person something specific. It was like I could overhear others' conversations. However, maybe not actually understanding the exact word they may have said. For example, I remember it happened all the time when I was in my bedroom, and I'd be playing with my Barbies by myself. Although I was using my imagination and playing with the dolls like normal, I would start to hear people, always adult sounding, talking to each other. It didn't sound like it was scary, nor did it sound muffled. But I didn't make out those specific words and they were just spoken. I was really used to this happening all the time. I didn't let it interrupt my playing. I just go about being my kid self. I also thought this was something that happened to everyone and never thought of it as odd. It just always happened. Let me clarify, this did not always happen. As if I were playing with other children. I could sometimes still pick up on the voices. But it wasn't nearly as loud or maybe I just ignored them. When I was by myself, it was so loud and there were so many conversations going on at once. I'd sometimes yell out loud for them to stop. I'd hear a few say things like, what, who's that? But only faintly, and then it would go back to just regular voices. Never a single conversation to understand. Again, several conversations at the same time. I never saw any ghost or had any scary feelings or uneasiness growing up. Nothing strange except for the voices. All the time. Now, I do want to say, although it's not something I talk about, I was being molested during this time for the same time frame by a much, much older cousin. For years, I thought this was just my kid's way of dealing with it. Obviously my defense mechanism, right? I no longer believe this because when I was in my late twenties, one of my cousins and I were discussing crap from our shitty childhood. And she mentioned hearing voices when she was a kid. I about shit myself. She knew immediately by my reaction. 
I had to. I told her that when I was little, I thought everyone had, and it wasn't until I was late teen that I realised not everyone had this. We discussed this for a long time, and our experiences were almost identical. Later, I told my daughter how our cousin and I got into this conversation, and hadn't told her any details about it being several conversations. And she revealed the exact same thing happening to her as a child. How could I not have known? Because I didn't ask. Why didn't I ask? I convinced myself later not to talk about it because I must have been crazy. And again, I figured it was just because I was messed up for my cousin being a sick freak towards me. Sometimes, they would just get so loud. A few years ago, I lived with my ex. We had a lot of paranormal experiences together, and I've come to realise he had a way of attracting that kind of energy. Since leaving him, I've only had a few minor experiences. At one point, we lived in a house where the previous owner may have died inside. We couldn't confirm it 100%, but were pretty sure. The house had been remodelled, so it was believed she had passed in what was now the master bedroom, attached to the bedroom where I slept. She was an older lady who was sick and passed away due to natural causes. Nothing too dramatic. We had a few different experiences in this home, in this room. One night when I was asleep, I was awoken by a loud woman's scream. It startled me awake and I sat straight up. It was dark. I couldn't see anything. The scream only woke me up. Not my dogs or my boyfriend. I brushed it off as a bad dream and went back to sleep. I told my boyfriend about it the next day. Another guy, we were both woken up by a loud scream. This time, it sounded almost like an animal. It sounded like it was coming from near the foot of our bed. One of my dogs did make noise when he slept, so I thought it might be him. Again, it was dark and I couldn't see. I felt around at the foot of the bed, but the dogs were all up between us. There were no dogs at the foot of the bed where it sounded like the sound came from. It's also worth noting my dogs are chihuahuas. They wouldn't really be capable of a noise like that. But I was trying to look at it logically to see how it could be explained away. One night, I was woken by my ex grabbing my arm suddenly. I looked over him and he looked scared. He was a big guy, six feet and about 275 pounds. He said he woke up suddenly when he felt something grab his leg and tried to pull him off the bed. It scared him, so he reached out for me and it stopped. Once he saw a shadow head peep out from behind the shower curtain to look into our room. It was a clear view if the door was open and it often was. There was always smaller noises and creaks in the house too. I did wake up to a big shadow dog by my side of the bed once as well. It's worth mentioning we had roommates right down the hall who never experienced anything. They never heard the screams either. Once we moved, we were never woken up by the screams again. I feel like it's also worth mentioning that while many of these experiences were startling and I was scared at the time, I never felt threatened or unsafe in the home. I actually really liked the place. We only moved because the landlord was selling the home. This happened quite a few years back now. I lived alone with my then boyfriend and our dogs. I came home from work one day with a terrible headache. I decided to go straight to bed to try and sleep it off. It was probably only like 5pm. I went into our room, turned the lights off and knocked out. My then boyfriend used to go to a car meet every Friday night and I knew he was going to go this night too. I woke up about midnight and checked my phone. I knew this was about the time my boyfriend usually got home, and he would probably be showing up soon. I stretched out in bed from my very long nap, which alerted my three dogs. So I was just for reference, that I was finally awake. They started jumping on me as they were excited I had finally woken up. 
I was grumpy since I had just woken up and was still tired. So I kind of snapped at them and told them to stop. Then I heard a very loud shh. I was in our bedroom, which was pretty dark since I had turned the lights off before I went to sleep. The lights were on in the living room, right outside our bedroom. The shh was so loud, I thought it was my boyfriend messing with me, so I even grunted in response. Since the lights were on in the living room, I thought maybe he was home a little early and maybe watching some Netflix. It was quiet after the shh though, so I waited thinking he was between episodes, but it stayed quiet. I'm afraid of the dark even as an adult, so it made sense my boyfriend at the time would leave the lights on for me. I was absolutely terrified. My automatic response in these spooky situations is to act completely unafraid. So I got up super nonchalant like everything was dandy and slowly and as calmly as possible walked over to turn on the light. Whilst turning on the light, I was able to glance at our living room area and see I was indeed home alone. I again very calmly and slowly walked back to bed, picked up my phone, and texted my ex telling him what happened. He thought I was worried about an intruder, so I reiterated I was not and was sure I was home alone. He was almost home and showed up about five minutes later. The shh was so loud, and when I was thinking about it after it happened, it sounded like it came from the closet in our room. Spooked the shit out of me. Nothing else really happened at that house to me, but my ex did have some other experiences. Never really felt threatened though. If there was something there, it didn't seem so bad. Two other houses we moved to after this had, had stuff happen. One more than the other. So my boyfriend has a question about something his mother experienced. A few months ago, we're certain he and his mother caught COVID. While he got through it okay, she kept getting worse and worse. We were eventually concerned enough to feel the need to call an ambulance. Well, when she had to go, she died twice. She said she saw nothing when she died. It was just dark. She's a very religious person, so she's a little concerned about it. But anyways, she stated she saw a big man with greyish blue satin suit and black round sunglasses who was apparently her doctor. The first time she saw him, he explained the situation by pulling the ventilator out of her throat. Once it was out, he said that she was having a hard time breathing and they needed to work on it or the ventilator would have to be put back in. She begged him not to put it back in. He said they would have to or she would die. The second time he came in and asked how she was doing. She told him she was doing better and stopped, mesmerised by telling him, you're the doctor that saved my life. He agreed. He told her that he needed samples from her and left the room. A nurse came in and his mom asked who the doctor was. The nurse was confused and said she never saw a doctor that matches that description after his mom explained what he looked like. This happened a few times the exact same way. But the third time he came in, she asked the doctor, if he could go up to the nurse's station and let them know that he was a real person. He agreed he would as a nurse walked in. And my boyfriend's mom said to the nurse, this is the doctor. This is the doctor that saved my life. The nurse looked at him and he told the nurse that he needed samples. Then he left the room and his mom asked the nurse what his name was. And she said, she's never seen him before. That was the last time she's seen him. She saw him not only at the main hospital, but also the rehab facility she had to go to. This story takes place in a farmstead in Ireland. The activity was particularly strong in the cabin. Really, I don't know when this started or what it is. However, I'm about 80% sure it's demonic in nature. My family is extremely Christian. The farmstead has had countless blessings in it and countless masses. The house itself was built on a famine trail. Basically, on the left side of the house in the living room, there's a trail. A trail people during the famine used to take to the shore to mass. A long time ago, there would be activity. Stuff ripped out from walls, 
footsteps, voices, possibly apparitions. A step was put in outside so the spirits would take a different route around the house. So now it ceased. But now I think something else has moved in, feeding off their energy. It first happened about three years ago. Late at night, I'd smell sulphur. Hear rustling, nothing much. Then I would feel an unbearable feeling of terror. A burning sensation in my chest would rise up like heartburn around 3am. I would squeeze my eyes shut because I felt if I opened them, I'd die. It was terrifying and would always take place from 3 to 4 a.m. That's the weak part. In the cow shed outside, it's even worse. There's just such an oppressive feeling. Once, I think I even saw something. Crouched in the corner, there was nothing shadowy about it. Nothing ghostly about it. It was solid. A woman, I think, back turned crouched in the corner. I didn't see it at first. I smelt it like rotting flesh and sulphur. I'd gone in for my skateboard that was leaning against the wall. When I smelt that, I spun round, spying it in the far end of the cow shed, crouched near some farm tools. As soon as I saw it, I knew it saw me. Even though it stayed, turned the whole time, just an oppressive feeling of guilt and terror, I felt unreasonably violent. I wanted to kill something. But all my feelings just faded and I just felt numb. And I realised I was walking towards it. As soon as I realised it all bubbled up again and I could hear screaming. So, so, so loud. I turned heel and ran. Locking the door behind me and sprinting back inside. I've never felt anything like that before. It happened once. I've been back since. Back in that cow shed since though I still feel uneasy there and my dog always whimpers. I'm going back there in a week or so for Easter. Not looking forward to it. This all started maybe four years ago. In my room opposite my bed is a window. The window has these nice lilac curtains with a shiny reflective curtain rail. At the end of the rail is a sphere. It began when I started to see a shadow reflected in that sphere. It filled me with just unrelenting terror. The stomach just falls. A figure of a man, or at least a man-shaped thing. It's completely black and seems to get closer when you focus on me. I learned to live with it. Not even looking at the curtain rail. I kept doing this for four years now until it left the curtain rail. It's not there anymore. I feel now I've ignored it. It wants me to see it. My dog, whenever he's in my room, hates sitting on the bed. This is a recent thing. I've said before that I think there's something in the laundry room. In my upstairs bathroom, there's a separate room. The door to said room keeps on locking, sometimes right in front of me. Whenever I wash my face, Having to turn my back to the room to face the sink, I just feel waves of unease. There was also the time I was home alone and heard something on the stairs. Locked myself in the downstairs bathroom with a knife. I could hear footsteps and loud breathing upstairs and on the stairs. I could also hear my dog losing his goddamn mind. When my mom came home and I felt safe enough to leave the bathroom, my dog was sitting at the bottom of the stairs. He was absolutely fixated. He's the type of dog that when you come home, will jump all over you so you can imagine how weird it was just sitting there, silently. So far, no harm has come to me or my mother or my dog, but that doesn't negate the fact that I'm absolutely terrified. My family owns a farmhouse in Ireland. It's an extremely rural area. The house experienced some paranormal activity in the past. The living room sits directly over a path people would take to the beach to either church or coffin ships or something else. We believe these famine victims continue to walk through the house. 
during the 1900s or 1920s. I can't remember. My great-grandmother or my great-great-grandmother heard a noise downstairs. She rushed down to see the impossible. The sacred heart lamp, which is literally screwed into the wall, was ripped out. The coals and ashes from the fire had been strewn about. The room was absolutely trashed. Terrified, she rushed back upstairs and stayed there for the remainder of the night. In the morning, the room was untouched. Perfect as if it hadn't been trashed. The house experienced many more experiences over the coming months and possibly years. I come from a very Catholic family, so the house was blessed. The activity only ceased as a step was built. A small pathway winds to the side of the house. A step was put next to it, so the spirits would take the path, not the house. My grandmother always told me to not ever, ever remove the stone. You would go on, but there's something scarier. Something happening right now that I fear. It's a very dense, though quite small patch of forest. Whenever I enter, I'm filled with dread. Makes me, quite frankly, want to piss my goddamn pants. I never feel alone there. As soon as I smell the wretched smell of rotting flesh, I hightail it out of there because I know it's close. It felt evil, malicious, and I don't know it had a physical body until I saw it. It was night time and I was looking out the window from my room. It looked like a person, a rotting person, a corpse. It was long and gangly and its arms looked like they had been pulled out of the sockets and the elbows jutted out. Its legs also looked disjointed. Its skin looked grey and sort of translucent. I couldn't tell a gender. I don't think it even has one. It had a horrible sunken face. Its eyes were so sunken, I couldn't see them, but I could see the light reflecting off them when it looked at me. I've never been more scared in my entire life when we locked eyes. Not when I split my head open, not when I lost my dog, not when I watched the news. I could properly see its face now. Its face did not have human features. Its nose, well, it didn't have a nose. Two slits in its face was it. Its cheekbones jutted out and it had no lips, but its mouth spread from ear to ear. And it was filled with rotted, brown, chipped, blunt teeth. My stomach dropped and I felt physically sick. And soon afterwards, I was physically sick. I immediately shut the curtains and prayed. I prayed and prayed and prayed for what seemed like hours. I did feel better afterwards. When I left the house the next morning, it looked like an animal's claw marks outside the door. I knew it had to be real and not a dream. But to convince myself that last little bit, I went to the edge of the forest, praying as I went. I also had holy water and rosary beads, anything I could get my mitts on. And sure enough, there were two deep, unhuman footprints in the mud. I was terrified, and when I looked up, I felt its gaze again, like this time it would come get me. I ran. I ain't athletic and I'm kind of chubby, but geez, I vaulted over a three foot high fence and ran up a goddamn hill to the house. I never, ever go to the forest anymore. And a funny feeling tells me I'm safe as long as I don't go to the forest, especially at night. I don't know what's in there. I know it doesn't want me specifically. Just people that wander in too far. If demons exist, this one, and I hope y'all don't ever meet it. My grandmother owns a house that was built by her ancestors, not too long after the famine. My grandmother's grandmother was in her bed one night when she heard a crash from downstairs. Obviously thinking she was being broken into, she ran downstairs. And the old style fireplace had its coals and contents strewn across the round. The sacred heart lamp was on the ground, surrounded by bits of wall. She knew immediately, this ain't no burglar. So she ran upstairs and went to bed but she could hear creepy shit all night from downstairs. In the morning, when she went to check, the fireplace was completely normal. Lamp in wall, no scratches on the floor, nothing out of the ordinary. 
I wasn't told what happened after, but I'm guessing she had to mass to bless the house or something. Now that house is up from the sea. Beautiful place in the Beira Peninsula island. We own loads of land from there to the sea. Now during the famine, people would walk where our house was, to the beach, to the famine ships and mass. What we think is that the spirits of the famine were still walking through the house though only on the living room side because that's where the trail was. I thought this was all poppycock until I spent more time when I could actually comprehend things in that goddamn house. I'd see people looking at me from windows, floors creaking in apparitions. Never told anyone this because I thought they wouldn't believe me, but one night when I was about ten, I went downstairs for a drink of water, but halfway down the stairs I stopped. Because in front of me was a train of ghostly white figures, Faces just about recognisable walking through the house. Obviously, I was frozen with shock, but just inched out of view. Gaunt men, women and children wearing literal famine rags, shuffled through the side of the house with the living room. It was like I could almost hear the faint whisper of chatter. Of course, I shot up the rest of the stairs and into my bed as quietly as possible. Now, I won't go anywhere in that house alone or stay in it alone. To back all this up, we found skeletons in the backyard. Famine skeletons, lots of them. I asked, and my uncle said there's probably hundreds more around the property. And probably even below the house. My grandfather, who my siblings and I were very close with, passed away in 2013. I was 14 when he passed, and I'm 21 now. My best friend, who's able to speak and see the spirits, had told me one day that there was a short man standing behind me. I asked what he looked like, and he said he was short, had black hair, and was combed back and a jacket on that I have hanging by the mirror to this day. She said he was also wearing a hat, all indicating that that was my grandfather. She had never seen him before and confirmed it was him when I showed her a picture. She told me that he's been following me all day because he needed to tell me something. The girl I was dating at the time drew a picture that had my grandpa's name on it, and I put it on my wall. She hadn't seen it at all, and told me that my grandpa wanted me to take down the picture, because the person who drew it had bad intentions for me, and he didn't like her. She also had no idea I had his jacket in my room, and he told her to tell me, to take his jacket and put it by my bed that same night. I was totally freaked out, because she didn't know my grandpa, the jacket, or the picture. He had always wanted to check in on me, and told me he loved and missed me. That whole night, I couldn't stop crying, because I had waited so long for my grandpa to contact me, and somehow, then he did. I also felt like he saved my life, because this girl was super manipulative and lied to me. She had made me suicidal. I started self-harming, and she was just horrible all around. She lied to me about her mum accepting her and liking me. She lied about self-harming a lot. And she lied about her mum beating her. She threatened suicide a lot when I tried to leave and so on. My mum told me later that he chose this person because he knew she was someone who could be trusted, and he knew of her abilities. I never forget that night, and I sometimes get chills when I think about it. My grandpa does visit sometimes, whether it's through a dream or I feel his presence in my room. He sometimes sits on the end of my bed or touches my feet, which he did to my mom and her siblings when they were younger. In November of 2017, my new girlfriend and I had only been dating a month when we took our first weekend getaway. We live in southern Illinois and drove about five and a half hours to Chattanooga, Tennessee to see Ruby Falls and Rock City, both great attractions. But unless you live within seven hours or are just passing through to another great location for a day or so, I really wouldn't recommend making a family vacation out of it. The area is mostly pretty, and my lady and I, being the stoners we are, of course love a picturesque cityscape, especially when mountains are present. 
We were only in Chattanooga for about a day overall, as it was dark out when we got there Saturday evening. We really only had time to go to dinner, enjoy vigorous lovemaking, and smoke a couple joints in the parking lot of the days in that night. The next day, we went to the aforementioned attractions, and the last thing we did as it was getting dark soon was go to Rock City, where they have this weird, completely dark cave area that's full of glow-in-the-dark fairy tale creatures and classic story characters. But instead of taking our time looking at the individual sections of the exhibit like we had planned, my wife was now very insistent that we leave Tennessee as soon as possible. She wouldn't tell me what was going on, but something in her eyes said that this was all very wrong. And being new to the relationship and not wanting to upset her, I grabbed her hand and we rushed out of there. We grabbed coffee and dinner about halfway back home when she told me that she felt an evil, angry entity present where we were in the cave exhibit and that it was so overwhelming, negative, that we had to leave. While I didn't feel that myself personally, I will say it's a weird place to stay the least though, so I kind of just dropped it and we made our way back home around 1am. We showered and went to sleep about half an hour later as we were very tired from the whole weekend of travel. Now here's where the experience actually occurred. About an hour or so after falling asleep, I very suddenly awoke to the very dark feeling of dread. Like everything in the world was wrong. And it was the same feeling that I had when I saw my wife's eyes earlier that day in the trippy cave exhibit. I closed my eyes and tried to ignore it, when in my mind's eye, I saw or even now I'll admit possibly imagined a horribly skinny charred black arm with a hand that had only three fingers with razor-sharp black claws, reaching up from under the bed and reaching for my wife. It was so real that my heart started pounding and I was absolutely terrified. That's when my wife let out the most horrifying scream I've ever heard in my entire life. And when she jumped out of our bed and ran for life, and was almost to the front door of our apartment, when I finally grabbed her and helped to get control of herself, I've never seen so much fear and horror in the eyes of someone I've loved before. She told me right there there was no way we were staying the night at our place with what happened and I agreed. It was very late, but I called my parents and they let us sleep in the guest room at their house. After I got my wife to calm down and go back to sleep, I privately told my dad what happened and and what I saw and him being the very religious man he is, said that what was attacking was certainly a demon and the black three-clawed arm was meant to be a mockery to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This shook and unsettled me. For another two years, I kept what I saw that night to myself, until when my wife finally brought it up one day, and told me she felt something very evil with sharp nails reaching out and grabbing her from under the bed. I finally confirmed my side of the story to her, because up until then, She was under the impression that it was her alone that knew what was going on that night, and she was mortified when I finally told her. We're both glad we're no longer in that apartment, and we agreed that while we never needed to hear each other's side of the story to know what happened exactly as it occurred that night, it definitely helped us grow as a couple to have that horrible experience.